Hello, son and daughter. Y'all ever wondered what hides in them old decrepit barns or what goes bump in the night out in them forgotten hollers? Well, buckle up, cause in tonight's compilation, Old Tex is taking you deep into the heart of hillbilly horror. Get ready to experience the spine chilling tales from the backwoods like never before. This was our second Sasquatch sighting as a group. I and two other good friends live in British Columbia, Canada. We've had a previous frightening sighting of a Sasquatch that visited us in the deep forest at our campsite, but this time was in the sand dunes. We go there for a spring break sometimes with our motocross bikes. After a long day of play in the dunes, we resorted to hanging out at the campsite. As we were sitting at the table, I noticed a large figure in the darkness walking in the middle of the road. I told my friends and we walked towards the figure. It never made a noise, not even sounds of walking. I clearly saw the figure walk directly out on the road and then it disappeared out of view. I don't think it was a person for a number of reasons. First of all, it was so dark that only the moon and residual light from campsites lit the area. Farther away, it was pitch darkness and the overnight temp was below freezing. This was a startling experience. Our first experience with a Sasquatch scared us very badly. It was stalking us in the bush. We watched it as it was watching us from roughly 10, 15 feet away. Just sitting there watching us, we could clearly see it. We sat there on a log by the fire, terrified. My friend Dan came up with a plan to scare it away. We slowly added more wood to the fire for more light. Jamie and I grabbed burning tree limbs from the fire as Dan jumped on his 250 and hit the kickstart and popped the clutch. As soon as the motor kicked over the Baja headlamp turned on, the light was on the Sasquatch that was mortified. You could see its facial expression. It was now terrified as we were. Jamie and I jumped up yelling with the logs and fire. Dan then rode his bike right up to hit trying to hit it. The Sasquatch freaked out and ran down the trail. We regrouped by the fire and tried to come up with an exit plan. We had ridden in on dirt bikes. Only one had a headlight, and the trail was too tight to ride in formation. We waited the first light to leave. As soon as there was enough light to see in the trails, we packed up and left. No one has believed us since. Only one other person has experienced with Jamie and Dan. A year after our first encounter, Jamie and Dan took a friend. Jared to the same campsite to shoot off fireworks for New Year's. They rode in on two dirt bikes, both with headlights. As they were shooting off the fireworks when the area was silenced, when not using fireworks, they could hear what would logically be a blue gross mating call, somewhat of an ump noise. They heard the noise all night long, didn't think too much about it. It became louder and louder. Then they heard the bushes moving and then something ran by them at close range. It ran into Jamie's bike, knocking it over on the side of the kickstand. They lit off all their fireworks in every direction. They had backpacks full. As one prepped the bikes, then Jared and Dan doubled on Dan's bike and Jamie, whose bike was knocked over, couldn't get his bike started. The electric start was turning over and over and he said he had the sense of something walking up behind him. Then his bike started. He pinned the throttle wide open, two-stroke motor, dumped the clutch and rode off at a motocross speed. Since then, we're a little paranoid of camping there again. Fifteen years ago, I was a young adventurer in search of new experiences and a chance to escape the monotony of my daily life. I landed a seasonal job with the United States Forest Service in western Colorado for the summer. It was a dream come true, allowing me to explore the wild and experience the beauty of nature up close. I was stationed in an old ranger cabin deep in the heart of the forest. It was quaint, rustic, and charming in its own way, but it was also quite isolated. I was the sole occupant of the cabin responsible for patrolling the area, maintaining trails, and keeping an eye out for any potential issues in the forest. 
One night after a long day of work, I settled into my cozy bed, the moonlight casting eerie shadows through the cracks in the wooden walls. I drifted off to sleep, my dreams filled with images of the forest and the creatures that called it home. In the midst of my slumber, I suddenly found myself in the grips of a vivid dream. It felt so real that I could almost touch it. In the dream, I was lying in bed, the darkness of the cabin enveloping me when I heard the unmistakable sound of footsteps outside. The sound was faint at first, but grew louder and more persistent, as if someone, or something, was pacing around the cabin, searching for a way in. My heart raced as I lay there, paralyzed by fear, unable to move or cry out for help. The footsteps grew nearer, and I could hear the sound of gravel crunching underfoot as the unknown intruder approached the front door. To my horror, the door creaked open and a chilling draft swept through the cabin. I woke with a start, my heart pounding in my chest and the echo of the dream still ringing in my ears. With trepidation, I glanced around the dimly lit cabin, my eyes slowly adjusting to the darkness. To my utter disbelief, the front door was wide open, just as it had been in my dream. A shiver ran down my spine, and the hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. Unable to shake the feeling of unease, I searched the cabin for any sign of an intruder, but found nothing amiss. I closed and locked the door, my mind racing with thoughts of what could have happened. Was it simply a coincidence, or had my dream been a premonition of something sinister? For the rest of the summer, I couldn't shake the fear that had taken hold of me that night. I made sure to secure the cabin every evening and slept with a large knife close by, just in case. The day has passed without incident, but the memory of that terrifying night remained etched in my mind. Now, fifteen years later, I still find myself thinking about that summer in the old ranger station. The beauty of the forest, the excitement of exploration, and the lingering sense of unease that haunted my dreams. I can't say for certain what happened that night or if it was merely the product of an overactive imagination, but one thing is clear, the forest holds secrets, and sometimes those secrets can seep into our dreams, leaving us with an unsettling reminder of the unknown that lies just beyond our reach. I'm Andy, a forest ranger in Sequoia. My duty was to protect the national park. So one day I received a tip about illegal activities taking place within a small section of the woods. Specifically, I was informed about a drug lab hidden deep in the heart of the wilderness. Armed with this information, I knew it was my responsibility to investigate and ensure the safety of the park and its visitors. Reading the coordinates scribbled on the note, I decided to scout the location myself before involving the police. It was already nighttime when I arrived at the designated area, parking my jeep just outside the woods. The darkness enveloped the surrounding trees, casting long, eerie shadows that danced with every flicker of moonlight. Determined to uncover the truth, I embarked on foot, my flashlight piercing through the darkness ahead. The air was heavy with anticipation as I navigated the unfamiliar terrain, relying on my knowledge of the park's trails and my instincts as a ranger. The sounds of nocturnal creatures and rustling leaves served as a haunting soundtrack to my journey. As I pressed forward, my attention was suddenly captured by an unusual green light. It flickered in the distance, drawing me closer with an irresistible curiosity. I cautiously made my way toward it, my heart pounding in my chest. To my astonishment, the source of the light revealed itself to be a figure, a banshee-like apparition or perhaps a young girl with an ethereal presence. Her gaze met mine, and in that moment I felt an eerie connection. I cautiously called out hello, but she remained silent her head turning slowly to face me. Her smile was unsettling, almost satanic in nature, and just like that she vanished before my eyes, leaving me stunned and questioning the reality of what I had witnessed. Shaking off the encounter, I continued my mission to locate the supposed drug lab. However, upon reaching the designated area, I am no trace of any illegal operation. 
It was as if the information I had received was fake or diverse, and much like the mysterious figure in the woods. As I made my way back to my cabin, the events of the night replayed in my mind. What was the meaning behind that unearthly encounter? Had I stumbled upon something beyond the realm of the natural world? Or was it simply a trick of the imagination, an illusion born out of the darkness in my own weariness? One of the scariest experiences of my life was in Tampa, Clearwater, Florida. I had to go get someone and help them move away. We were stalked by a Scientologist. No joke, I would go on the porch to smoke, and they had a person watching us from the window next door. Hoodie up, barely any light, and just stood there staring the whole time. I didn't even see them move at all. I was scared to even go to sleep. When we went out into town, they would follow us around. I couldn't even tell you everything that happened, from having random numbers screamed at me and being overall strange. I would rather deal with anything the backwoods can throw at me rather than that cult. So if you want a terrifying experience, just make Scientology mad law. I live in the backwoods and feel way safer here than I ever did there. Well, that's my scary Florida experience. I'm in North Florida, and I've had some weird things happen. Beyond my backyard is about 50 acres or more of woodland that is uninhabited. Beyond that, it's rural and not too many people around. You can hear deer, possums, raccoons, and hogs at night tromping through the brush. But there's something else out there every now and then. It walks with the pacing of a person, and loud too, like someone was walking around, not bothering to be sneaky about it. I've shined a flashlight near the sound like I've done before, because I like to see the wildlife you don't usually get to watch. When I do this, the animals will freeze, and I can sometimes catch a glimpse if they're not too far. This happens with this thing, but the steps never come back. I spent hours outside after this, and I have never heard a peep after looking for the source. There will also be no sounds of any other critters for quite some time, which is creepy by itself. It's unnerving and reaches something deep in you that makes you feel like everything is off. About a year ago, something had begun to terrorize my cats and injured one a bit, but nothing life-threatening yet. One night, my kittens were being attacked and the mama cat was scared which is the opposite of her nature with them. It was chaos, cats screaming and whatnot. So I got my shotgun and went out. A black cat had chased them up a tree. It was just sitting at the base of the tree. I can't properly explain the feeling I got from it. It's a pretty regular occurrence to have feral cats come through, and they're fairly dangerous to small animals. I was able to walk up to the back fence where it was about six foot to the tree with my kittens and the asshole cat. It didn't budge when I got close. No fear at all. I shot my shotgun into the brush to get it to run off. Didn't even flinch. At this point, it was my cat's or this stray, so I made the difficult decision to shoot it from six foot away with a 12 gauge. I missed. I'm a very good shot, as I've had a lot of training through law enforcement employment. The damn cat still didn't move. I shot at it two more times with no damage to the cat. It meandered off like nothing had happened. I've tried to figure out how this could be rationally explained, and I've got nothing. During the day, things will get weird, too. If you go for a stroll in the woods, as my four-year-old loves to do, you will find yourself in the eerie silence I mentioned before. No birds, no squirrels, nothing and you begin to see a figure out of the corner of your eye. It goes from tree to tree, and you never have enough time to turn and look at it. My wife has seen it too, so I know it's not a peripheral artifact of some sort. Once you're being followed by whatever this is, it won't leave you until you leave the woods. My father was a park ranger and he always loved the woods as nature provided him and his family with countless memories. And my grandfather was also an explorer, so he always used to wander many places with his curious mind. 
Eventually, my father acquired the trade and became a ranger. It was one of those holidays when tourists come in search of adventure but end up getting in trouble. People come to the national parks for fun, experience some for field research. However, there was this team who my father had assisted. They had come in search of a secret toy unknown. Now I know I may sound like a total dumbstruck human, but they were a team of five researchers who were sane and educated, maybe more than the rest. One night, my father's acquaintance got a signal on walkie, talkie. It was a signal from one of his fellow researchers. After grabbing his rifle, he went ahead and investigated. When his jeep would not allow him to go any further, they had to walk the rest of the path. The tracker with the group stopped working after one time. So now, they had to search in two different directions. Therefore, they decided to tie ribbons that way they were going so nobody could get lost. Yellow was his color, and blue was one of his partners. As my father went ahead, he tied ribbons as a mark of the way. He kept venturing deeper into the woods, but could not find the group. Therefore, he tried to contact his partner through walkie-talkie, but never did get an answer back. Now he is still walking and tying ribbons. When one time he encountered a yellow ribbon tied to a tree, maybe he took a different route before. Then again, he did go into a different direction looking out for them. After 15 to 20 minutes, he encountered the ribbon yet again. This kept happening, so this time he stopped to take a rest. While he was sitting under the tree, he looked up casually and the ribbon caught his eye. It looked different for some reason. So he got up to look at it and to his surprise, this was not the ribbon he tied earlier. These ribbons looked old and worn out. Besides, the knot on the ribbon was double knotted, and he tied them in, only one knot. This area is restricted where only important personnel were allowed. So who would come all the way out here and tie these yellow ribbons halfway to a tree? He knew something was amiss. My father came up with the idea of following these unknown marks and finding his way to the correct ones. When he was walking his way back, he heard some signing, and there was light coming from that direction. When he was walking in the direction of the light, he discovered a group of researchers who were wearing weird clothing and dancing in circles with fire in the middle. There were only four of them. One person was missing. He had hid behind a big tree and tried to figure out what they were trying to do. Two of them went into the woods, brought a big wooden branch and a man tied to it, his two hands and legs bound together. He was definitely dead, and they tried to cook him alive. My father was scared to see this, so he reached up to contact his partner. But there was no response. After having that choice, he left. But when he got up, he heard the sound that something was still around. And now, his life was in danger. He too ran away. And these cannibalistic murderers were still behind him. He climbed up a tree to try and divert their attention. And they were there waiting for him just below the tree. When he carefully looked at their feet, he could see that these things, they weren't exactly people, but like people. They were wicked looking. Well, they looked human. They were different in appearance. He knew immediately something was very wrong. These things scoured around the forest looking for him. They didn't realize that he had climbed himself up in a tree and was waiting for these things to leave. They were these hideous-looking creatures that were like men, but emaciated, slender and white, having huge fangs and large, hollowed-out eyes. And once they had finally disappeared, he slowly made his way down the tree, looking for every direction, making sure these things were not coming back. That's when my father began to fall unconscious. He was poisoned. Something had seeped into his skin, and he fell right there, collapsing on the forest floor. Next thing, he's waking up in the hospital when he described the incident to senior officials, and they denied his statement. Any clearance he had should have been revoked. It was very shortly after this that he was no longer a park ranger. He was stripped of virtually everything he had at that career. It was also after this that my father had received multiple death threats. There were some things he's seen that day and information he knows that is very sensitive and that is not allowed to escape into the public.
My dad used to rent this house way out in the middle of nowhere. A good 45 minutes from any town, the closest neighbor was another 15 minutes away. On this property were several enclosures for raising pheasants. These belonged to the property owner, so my dad had no responsibility towards them, other than to notify the owner if he saw anything wrong. He was high school buddies with the owner, so they were on good terms. Well, one morning he notices something very wrong. In the pheasant enclosure furthest from the house, with a good fifty or so birds, every single one of them had been slaughtered overnight. What was even weirder was that it didn't seem to be an act of predation. None of the birds seemed to have been consumed. Luckily, the owner had cameras, and they got to see what really happened. So sometime in the middle of the night, a man neither of them recognized had wandered onto the property. He made no attempt to approach the house, but instead crawled under the enclosure's fence and proceeded to catch and stab each pheasant with a knife while wearing a headlamp. They caught the entire event on camera, from him entering the property till he left early in the morning. The police were called, but nothing ever came of it. My dad was so freaked out from the whole event that he made us stay with our mom for several weeks while he slept in bed with a gun. The property owner tightened up security with new fences and alarms. He even bought some guard dogs. They were very well trained and super friendly to anyone who'd approach them during the day. Nothing ever happened again on that farm, and the bird-killing psycho was never found. My name is Jake, and I'm a National Guard agent. My unit and I were deployed to a remote region in Appalachian Mountains to investigate the sudden disappearance of several hikers and campers. As we arrived, we were immediately met with fearful whispers and nervous glances from the few remaining locals. They told us terrifying stories of a creature called the Crawler, which had been spotted lurking in the shadows of the dense forest. Though the story seemed unbelievable, the fear in the eyes of those who had seen the crawler was genuine. Unsettled but determined to find the missing people, my unit and I ventured deep into the uncharted wilderness. The locals gave us map of places where disappearances happened. Our search led us to a series of underground tunnels and caves, a hidden world that seemed to stretch on forever. As we descended further into darkness, our flashlights barely cutting through the gloom, we came face to face with the horrifying reality of the crawler. It was a monstrous being, unlike anything we'd ever seen, capable of hunting and killing with terrifying ease. We spotted it while it was devouring some corpse. We aimed our rifles and started shooting. We knew we had to use our tactical training and survival instincts to evade the creature. The creature was fast, even killing few of our men, but in the end it fallen under the barrage of our bullets. As we approached the carcass of a cryptid, we noticed a stamp that said United States Government. As we returned to the surface carrying the lifeless carcass of the crawler with us, we couldn't help but wonder what other secrets lay hidden in the uncharted wilderness. Our mission had succeeded but the truth we'd discovered left us questioning the world we thought we knew. In the end, we'd vanquished a cryptid, but the secrets of government involvement that surrounded it would continue to haunt us. I was critically injured after being attacked by a large and powerful unknown creature. The attack took place one night in an abandoned building on the outskirts of town. My close friend and colleague who was with me at the time described what he witnessed that night. I was there with him. We were searching the building for a suspect when all of a sudden something came rushing out of one of the rooms. It knocked me off my feet. When I got back up, he was being attacked by this monster. It was much stronger than anything I've seen. It was able to throw me ten feet in the air with ease. My partner pulled up his firearm, firing it several times, but it wouldn't budge an inch, like the bullets didn't even bother it. I don't know what happened after that. I blacked out for several moments. When I came to, the creature had already disappeared, and I was unconscious, badly injured and bleeding with a head injury and broken ribs. I remember seeing my partner pointing his firearm at an unknown creature. I felt my gun jam, 
When I looked up, the unknown being seemed to disappear in front of me. I went to check on my partner and found him not breathing. I was able to regain consciousness, but quickly collapsed again shortly thereafter. Police officers were immediately dispatched to the scene. They took both of us to a nearby hospital for treatment. We both sustained serious injuries and were unable to work for several months during the recovery period. Sometimes some of the scariest things don't necessarily have to be a torn up body or tons of blood. They just have to be unexplained. So I work for the forestry department and I often travel around conducting various bits of research. I've gotten to travel far and wide, often ending up in the most remote and often beautiful places that would be extremely unlikely to see your average Joe ever go to, unless, like me, it was something to do with their job. Therefore, when you find something in one of these spots that has very obviously been left by a person, there is absolutely no rhyme or reason for it. You can't help but jump to nefarious conclusions. So, when you're out in the middle of absolutely nowhere up in the ass end of Canada, with nothing around for miles, and you find a bed, it's kind of weird if not downright unnerving. And I want to be clear, I don't mean like some leaves and twigs, something somebody had created as a bed for themselves. I mean an actual single wooden bed, complete with rotten, moldy mattresses, multiple mattresses. Can you think of a singular reason why that would be there? There are no houses or any sort of building structures that used to be or are, are still there for miles and miles. In fact, the nearest road, I believe, is about 46 miles away, or in Canadian, 46 kilometers. There were no recent tracks except mine, although from the state of it, it did seem like it had been there for a very long time. It seemed like a very unusual place just to dump a bed you didn't want anymore. And also, why? Who would haul a bed all the way out here? I ended up alerting the cops, wondering if maybe it had been used for a crime and dumped out here since it was unlikely anybody would ever find it. Or maybe this was some kind of gang kill location. It seemed rather implausible, and thankfully I couldn't see any obvious stains on the bed or around it. But who knew? I've never heard back about it, so I guess it wasn't the missing puzzle piece in some nationwide serial killer hunt, but I still can't think of a single good reason why it would have been there. Me and my friend were bone hunting. I live in a very rural place in the Pacific Northwest. We went about a mile off a trail and were pretty deep in the woods miles from anyone. We were coming down from this hill next to a stream and started getting into some thick brush and trees. That's when we heard this deep growl. We both stopped. I was a few yards away from him and was closer to the noise. He asked me if I heard it too. We both stood still, although I couldn't see him well. I knew we were both looking in the direction of the sound. We didn't see any movement or heard it again. It was very creepy, and we have no idea what it was. I don't know what would be creepier if it was an animal or something paranormal. So I'm going to start this off with some backstory. I was minding my own business alongside my parents in a nice home in northeast Alabama. I'm not sure exactly when this was, but I was around seven in age. Anyways, we're sleeping peacefully, and suddenly we're all three awoken by this absolutely terrible growling sound, almost like that of a bear. This wasn't just a normal sound, though. It sounded like it was on our front porch. My dad assumes that a black bear has decided to chill on our porch, and he grabs his shotgun, prepared to defend himself if necessary. He holds me and my mother up and goes outside, ready to confront this bear. To his surprise, no bear was outside. He assumes it ran off and tells us we can just go to sleep again since all is fine. He assured us that bears can't unlock doors like that helped any. Right before we begin falling asleep again, we hear a very distant giggling. This doesn't give off the vibe of a normal giggle, though. 
It gives off that, oh, hell, no tone that makes you just want to get out of Dodge. My mother whispers to my dad, What the hell was that? And my dad whispers over to me, Was that you? I simply reply, No. Another few moments pass, and we hear a slight yelp, seemingly closer, but also quieter. We don't think anything of it. At least that's until we hear a woman scream distantly. This once again gets my dad and mother up and alert. My dad once again grabs his shotgun, but this time he doesn't go outside. He even seems scared now. Obviously, this worries me. After about 30 seconds of us kind of just sitting around, another scream happens. But this time it's directly in our yard, about 10 yards away. My dad rushes to turn off the lights and simply whispers, don't say a word. I'm not sure what exactly happened after that, but nothing else seemingly happened that night. I'd assume I dozed off. I'm not sure why this only just now clicked with me, but I now realize this fits the description of a skinwalker really well. It's possible it might have all been a misunderstanding by my family, but I simply don't think that'd be the case considering my parents recall the same things. I've recently done a lot of research into skinwalkers, and I've rethought this past trauma of mine and made a connection. Sorry for this being drawn out, but I just randomly decided to post this before I forgot any important notes on the event, even though I doubt I'd likely ever forget any of this. Extra note. I'm sure somebody would ask this, so I'm gonna go ahead and answer it. I didn't have nightmares and stuff before the event other than the usual child nightmare stuff, but I did have a few eerie nightmares directly following the event. One dream I dreamed of being chased down a hallway by some creature. Not sure if it was human or what. Another dream I had my entire family's voices had gone demonically deep, and they all kept saying, don't hide. And the last one I'll point out is a dream where my mother disappeared out of nowhere, like thin air out of the car. All of these I vividly remember and still creep me out to this day. I am posting this for my boyfriend who doesn't have a Reddit. Last weekend he went on a two-mile hike into a small creek to fish in North Carolina. On his way up the mountain he kept thinking that he saw things in his peripheral vision looking backwards to see shadowy dark crags in rocks or a shadow falling along the tree bark. The mountain air was crisp and refreshing, at an altitude of over 2,000 feet, yet whenever he felt this weird presence, he described smelling something like a propane tank up to his nostrils, sulfur and damp stickiness. There was no explanation or reason to smell that in this place. He had visited many times before and never smelled this in the area. The whole way up, the unsettling feeling of being watched maintained and he just kept chanting God, is with me, I will fear no evil. He swore to me that he felt like something was following him, all the way up, maybe too scared to get close, and that he now thought he knew what a demon smelled like. He made it to his fishing spot and returning down the mountain, again saw the unmistakable shadowy movement out of the corner of his eye, blend back into the trees behind him. Has anyone ever been alone in the woods and smelt that same smell or felt any kind of presence like this? I know that there is a lot of folklore around the Appalachian Mountains about haints and things of that sort. I think he wants to figure out what it means and know if he's alone in this experience. The place was called Panther Town Creek. My father was a man of few words, a stoic figure with a past shrouded in secrecy. As a CIA operative during the height of the Cold War, he was privy to the darkest corners of espionage and covert operations. Before his passing, he shared with me a spine-tingling story, one that sent chills down my spine and left me questioning the boundaries of reality. Today, I feel compelled to recount his story, to share the enigma that haunted him until his dying breath. It was in the wake of a catastrophic nuclear disaster in the former Soviet Union that my father found himself on a mission of utmost importance. The CIA had sent him to investigate the disappearance of a rogue Russian scientist named Vladimir, 
a man who possessed critical knowledge about the incident and the potential threat it posed to global security. The gravity of the situation weighed heavily on my father's shoulders, yet he remained steadfast in his resolve. Deployed somewhere in Eastern Europe, my father maneuvered through the shadows of a world steep in uncertainty. The Iron Curtain still held its grip, and danger lurked around every corner. But it was during one fateful night while on patrol in a small town in what is now Slovakia that he encountered something that defied comprehension. As he traversed the darkened streets, a figure emerged from the depths of the night. Cloaked in an all-black coat, it stood at a towering height of ten feet, a chilling presence that sent shivers down my father's spine. Its eyes gleaming with an otherworldly intensity bore into his very soul. But what caught his attention most were the two elongated fangs that protruded from its mouth, akin to those of a vampire from the stories of old. This creature, this abomination, moved with a grace that belied its grotesque nature. It discreetly hunted down its victims, leaving no trace of its existence. But on that fateful night, it found itself face to face with a CIA operative. Sensing danger, it fled into the depths of darkness, leaving my father in stunned disbelief. Driven by a mix of curiosity and duty, my father gave chase, desperate to unravel the mystery that had unfolded before his very eyes. But his efforts were in vain, for the creature vanished into the night, leaving behind only questions and a lingering sense of unease. The following day, my father resumed his mission, pressing forward in pursuit of his objectives. Yet, a nagging uncertainty gnawed at the edges of his consciousness. What had he truly witnessed? Was it a figment of his imagination? A manifestation of the weariness that consumed him? Or had he stumbled upon a dark secret that lay hidden within the realm of the supernatural? In the years that followed, my father never spoke of that night to anyone but me. It became our secret. When I was around 11, I got very into fairies, but more in a witchy way, I guess you could say. I realize that's kind of old for a kid to be into things like this, but you gotta know I was a very imaginative, somewhat lonely kid. I've always loved fairies, and my mom got me a book on them. It included fairy language and a list of gifts to offer fairies should you wish to interact with them. Of course, I wanted to contact them. What little girl wouldn't? For about a month, I wandered out to my backwoods and by a river, because according to the book, fairies like to hang out around water and leave little notes written in the supposed language, along with little gifts and offerings. I'd make them little leaf baskets, leave them candy or flowers, things like that. I even recited a chant. Yeah, I know. I think part of me knew it was silly and that I'd probably never get results. But damn if I wasn't determined. So I kept on. At one point, my gifts and notes started disappearing from the bench I had left them on. I figured it was wind or birds taking it, but a small part of me hoped it was something else. A month of this nonsense and I was getting very discouraged. I decided to leave a few more gifts for them and this time I weighed them down with small rocks so they wouldn't blow away and I'd know for sure. A day went by and my gifts were still there. Another day, same thing. Then on the third day of checking I found the gifts gone but the rocks still there. Only the rocks were moved around. I don't remember how soon after that this happened. But eventually, I got what I had wanted. I wandered out to the woods and saw by the river two monarch butterflies. They were very large, and I wanted to see them up close. However, one landed on a branch close to the path where I was standing, and I noticed this butterfly had limbs. Tiny, thin, pale, limbs, hands, feet. I stopped dead in my tracks and looked hard to make sure I wasn't hallucinating. It was broad daylight, and I could see very clearly. It wasn't a butterfly. It was a fairy. She had long, thin brown hair that went down past her feet in a blue dress that looked like a small scrap of fabric. But what terrified me above all else was her face. Her eyes were giant black bug, alien-like eyes. 
but she definitely had a face and she definitely saw me. I didn't even try to go look at the other one because I ran. I was so scared that I bolted home and locked my door. After freaking out and keeping an eye on my backyard, the backwoods, through the window, I went back. No surprise, they were gone, and I never saw them again, despite me trying over and over again. My gifts were never taken again. I felt sad and stupid because I felt like I ruined my chance to have fairy friends, but knowing what I do now, it was probably a blessing they left me alone. What do you guys think? Has anyone else seen a fairy, and did they look like this? I just need to find someone else who has seen what I have seen. It's something I'll never, ever forget. I remember her so clearly I could draw her. Note, I went to the library and looked at every book on butterflies I could find, googled, and I couldn't find a butterfly matching any description that looked like what I saw. So I'm going to start by saying I'm basically a skeptic when it comes to the paranormal. Although I love hearing stories and listening to others' points of views when it comes to that kind of stuff, this is why I'm having such a hard time understanding what happened to me last September. My dad, grandma, grandpa, and I were attending my cousin's wedding in a small rural town just outside of South Haven, my late last summer. We rented a small house in town, which was located in a very wooded area just off of a small lake. Something felt extremely off as soon as I got out of the car at our rental property. That's the best way I could describe it. Something felt off and I was immediately uneasy. But being the skeptic that I am, I shrugged it off and chalked it up to being tired and anxious. The night we arrived, my dad and I were having a smoke outside and noticed how weird everything sounded. It was about 11 p.m., and there was no one else around. The trees were crackling incredibly loudly, and we were hearing strange animal noises, but nothing too out of the ordinary, just the type of animal noises you would hear in rural Mai, but they just sounded particularly strange to us for some reason. We said our good nights and went to bed. The next morning, my dad told me that he went outside for a smoke at about two-ish that morning and heard what sounded to him like someone close by banging on metal siding. He said it sounded like it was just next door, but didn't hear anything leading up to or preceding the loud banging, like footsteps or anything like that. We shrugged and laughed it off. The second night was when I heard the thing that I still can't stop thinking about six months later. It was about 11 p.m., Midnight and I was having my last smoke of the night. My grandparents were already asleep and my dad had just gotten into bed, but still awake watching TV. I was sitting on the stairs outside with my back to the house looking straight out into the backyard. I heard someone shout my name in a very abrupt manner, loud and fast. It sounded like they were shouting toward me from the front of the house, like they were standing on the front porch shouting for me, knowing I was at the back of the house. It sounded just like my dad, but it couldn't be him because I didn't hear the front door open or close or anything. Being a skeptic, I reminded myself to stay calm, and I quickly walked back into the house. My dad was sound asleep. There was no way that by the time I got to him, he could have gotten back into bed. I woke him up and asked him if he was outside screaming my name. He looked confused and said, of course not. I started to get really freaked out at this point. I tried to go to bed, but couldn't get that scream out of my head. I was up all night trying to figure out what happened. I was honestly contemplating leaving, getting a hotel room somewhere close by, and returning in the morning. Miraculously, I must have fallen asleep sometime around 3 a.m. We woke up the next morning, and I was so ready to get the hell out of that town. As soon as we left, the uneasy feeling I had the entire weekend disappeared. When I returned to work the next day, I told my co-worker the weird experience I had. Her face immediately dropped. She proceeded to inform me that this is quite common in the Appalachian area regarding cryptids and other types of creatures. Apparently, they try to get your attention by mimicking someone close to you, and when you look at them, they kidnap you or something along those lines. But I was in Michigan. I tried to look up information about the town I was in, 
but didn't find anything remotely interesting. Has anyone else had a similar experience? This happened in the American Southwest to my parents while on vacation. They stopped at a spot along their travel route to get some food and got talking to a young local who worked there. He told them about a box canyon that was on the way to their next stop. For those who don't know, a box canyon is characterized by being narrow, having high vertical walls, and a flat bottom. To hear my mom tell it, he described the canyon with an almost spiritual reverence, saying that it was incredibly beautiful and had superb acoustics, and that he loved taking his guitar out there to play. My folks like doing stuff off the beaten path, so they decided to pay a visit. The canyon seemed to be quite isolated with no buildings of any kind around it for miles. By the time they parked their car and made it to the canyon's entrance, the sun was just starting to go down. They said they seemed to be the only ones there with no parked cars other than their own. They made their way into the canyon. After the fact, my parents have both said that they separately, without speaking of it, started to feel a touch of unease, not totally unreasonable, as it was starting to get dark and the canyon walls pressed close on either side. Despite this feeling, they continued on, until they heard the noise. My parents report the nature of this noise differently. When I ask them to describe it, their faces sort of scrunch up, like it's an effortful task or they're still uncertain. My dad says it sounded like a person possibly a man, speaking a low single word that he didn't understand. My mom says that it didn't really sound like a word of any kind to her, just a strange deep noise that rang out from somewhere nearby above them. It was accompanied by a brief intense flash of pale light. Neither of them knew what it was or where precisely it had come from but they both were immediately filled with dread and an overwhelming desperation to get the hell out of the canyon. They turned around and booked it back to their car. As they exited the dark, close space of the canyon, my mom describes feeling certain there was something chasing them and thinking that once they got to their car, they would find it sabotaged. That, thankfully, was not the case, and they were able to get in and speed away down the empty road. My mom said she didn't feel safe until they'd been driving for a while, still having the panic but totally unsupported notion that they were being pursued. When they eventually spoke of it to one another, they weren't able to make any real sense out of what had happened. Neither one of them really has a theory. This is probably pretty dull as far as spooky experiences go but neither of my parents have a history of weird encounters or of telling tall tales, and so it strikes me to see them both get re-creeped out by the mere memory of this incident. Eight, I've asked my mom clarifying questions since I first recorded this story, and I forgot to update. She said that the flash of light was actually quite close to them, mere feet away, and that it sort of seemed to hang in the air for a few moments. She had a hard time describing it very clearly. When I was six, I got up in the middle of the night to get a glass of milk. Being that I was six, I went through the back door to the back porch to pee, then went back inside to get my glass of milk. Our back door had those older metal-type blinds that rattled and clanked when you opened the door every time. Our back door had the door handle lock and two deadbolts. I specifically remember locking all three locks that night before getting my drink because the top lock always stuck and took some off to lock it. And I was trying to be quite so I didn't wake my parents up. I opened the fridge and pulled the milk out. And when I closed the fridge, I noticed the back door wide open and something was in the doorway. I remember standing there for what seemed like hours, and it was probably only a few seconds before I ran to get my dad. When I woke him up and we went into the kitchen, the kitchen light was on. I did not turn it on, and the back door was still wide open. I didn't open it. I know I closed it. I did not hear the blinds rattle when it opened. I don't know what I saw, but something was there, and I know 100% that I shut and locked that door, and short of a couple hits from a sledgehammer or a tornado, that door wasn't going to be blown open by the wind, especially with both deadbolts. 
That freaked me out pretty good. I can't explain it to this day, but it still makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. On another occasion, more recently, in high school, we had a school function and were allowed to take our own vehicles. So my buddies and I took my truck and headed to the function, except we had a couple bottle of Jack with us. I proceeded to get ripped throughout the night, and when it came time to leave, my friends were not going to let me drive. Well, I somehow got my keys from one of them, got in my truck, locked it, then started it through it in reverse, and when backing up almost hit another car. I put it in drive and started out of the parking lot. When I stopped at the exit to look before getting on the road, I remember looking in my rearview mirror, and I was just able to make the shape of a man out, and I heard the words don't do it. You won't make it two times, and then I saw my truck wrapped around a big tree on the side of the road that I was going to take home. I remember it clear as day and won't ever forget it. I put it in park and called my buddies over. They drove me home and made sure I got in all right. I can't explain that. Maybe it was the booze, maybe not. But I know for a fact that had I drove home that night, I know I would not have made it. To this day, I do not get behind the wheel if I think I might have had too much to drink. Every time I think about it, I think back to that incident. Guardian Angel. Maybe who knows? I am not crazy, but I can't explain what I saw or what I heard on those two occasions. Ghosts, angels, spirits. I don't know, but I know I saw and heard something. There is still too much that is unexplainable in this world for me to say whether I believe in ghosts and what not not, but until it is proven... Otherwise, I will always lean to the side of believing. My parents got married in 1979 and moved to Belton. They had my older sister, and shortly after that, my mom's dad died. Several months passed, and one day they went into a Chinese food place where they were close friends with the family that owned it. As they were eating, the wife of the owner came over to their table to tell my mom that her father had come in the previous day. She noted the specific table and chair he had sat at and a vivid description of him. She said he had been asking about each one of them, including my older sister. He had been dead for five months or so. My mom was so rattled by it that she didn't even tell the lady he was dead. To this day, she doesn't really like to talk about it. Crazy stuff. When I was in elementary school, my folks decided to build a new house. The spot they chose was a spot that an old house had been standing on. My grandfather bulldozed the old house after he bought the place. Well, after my folks' house was completed, strange things started happening. I could lay awake at night and hear cabinets in the kitchen, shutting in drawers rolling in and out. Never really scared me. It just became normal. Everyone in the house could do the same thing. My great-grandmother absolutely refused to go into our house because she believed it to be haunted. Example, she told a story, and we did look it up in old newspapers to confirm it. That just across the road, a boy had been killed by shotgun accidentally going off as he crossed the fence. The boy's name was Bobby Reynolds. This happened in the 40s. My baby sister, about five years old at the time, had an imaginary friend. One day, my mother walks by her as she was sitting talking to a corner. Mom asks, who are you talking to? My sister's answer, my friend Bobby. No one had ever told her about me great-grandmother's story for fear it would frighten her. My mom doesn't believe in ghosts, but she does believe in angels. She believes that Bobby is my sister's guardian angel. I was working as an information technology contractor for MGM Studios during the year 2000. It was a lot of fun working there. Getting to see movie props such as the Stargate was an extra bonus. I was staying at the Georgian Hotel in Santa Monica during a major renovation. Having worked at MGM for a month, my contract was coming to an end. During my last night at the hotel, I woke up suddenly at approximately 3 a.m., Via the light from the window and the night light in the room, I could see something floating in the middle of the room. 
It was the head of something I'd never seen and never want to see again. It was grotesque, a man's head with snakes as hair. Its skin, which looked dark green, seemed to be moving with smaller snakes. As I watched it, it moved its lips as if it was trying to talk to me, but I couldn't hear anything. I could see the back of its head in the mirror on the wall in front of me. I really don't know how I knew to say this, but I told him it wasn't welcome, and he had to leave. After seeing this a few more times, it just slowly faded away. I got up and turned on the lights in the room. Working for MGM, I thought maybe one of the guys I was working with was playing a joke on me. I checked the whole room for anything that could produce this head image, but I found nothing. Needless to say, I didn't go back to sleep. When the time came to check out later that morning, I was too embarrassed to say anything. Heading into work one last time, I did ask the guys if they knew anything about it. They all said no and promised me they would never do anything so cruel. One of them did tell me that the hotel was in fact haunted. This incident has left me wondering just what it was I saw that night. I think it might have been a demon looking for someone to possess. So my sister called my family the other day and told my parents about a strange man that she and a friend came across. They had been there for about a week and were out walking in the redwoods when a man appeared out of practically nowhere and startled them. My sister claimed that he looked completely normal and was even kind of handsome, in her opinion, but he gave off a creepy vibe pretty quickly. He apparently began asking them weird questrions like who they were and what they were doing out in his woods. After they explained that they were just out exploring, he quickly got annoyed and said they were liars. My sister and her friend began to walk away quickly as they assumed he was probably on drugs, but he walked after them and said more weird stuff. She says he even asked them to kiss each other because he knew they were lesbian lovers. They are not lesbians, by the way. My sister's friend apparently turned around and screamed at him to leave them alone. My sister said this is where he got scary as hell. She says he gave my sister and her friend the missed evil and hateful look she's ever seen in her life, and he said this in response. You two are such disrespectful bitches, I've killed a few of you over the last few years, and he'll love to add you both to my account. My sister and her friend didn't even hesitate and both booked it right after he said that. They heard him chasing after them and screaming at them. My sister says that she couldn't make out much of what he said other than that he would chop them up and a few other threats. They both made it safely out of the woods and they didn't see him anywhere. They got in their car and sped back to the town they were staying in. They called the police to file a report and headed to another area and will be heading home soon. I'm scared and pissed off that some creep did this to them. I served my country, Great Britain, for 12 years all over the globe. I've seen my fair share of face, to face with some of the most evil people on earth, but nothing comes close to this. I was sent to Alberta, Canada to do some training back in 1993. On the first day, I and a friend decided to go for a walkabout to get to know the area. We bumped into a few Canadian soldiers. A few words were exchanged, and one shouted back, Don't let the monkeys keep you awake. They laughed. We just looked at each other and then carried on. While out on exercise, a few of the guys said they were woken up in their sleeping bags by being pulled along the ground. I heard this a few times over the weeks. Also, their kit rations and other bits going missing. Nothing came of it. Also, an incident of one soldier missing, who was found the next day miles away from his platoon. He said he couldn't remember why he got separated, but felt that he was followed during the night by some animal. Nothing more was said. We spent around 19 months out there. On one occasion, I was going out to check the lay of the land, and a group of Canadian soldiers were just coming in. It looked like they had been out for a few days, looking at the state of them. One of them asked me, you going out? I replied, I don't know, he said. Monkeys, watch your back. I replied, okay. I was thinking that I heard this before. 
I noticed the guys had their heads down. They looked pretty worn out. A few months on one of the guys said something about seeing three bears walking toward him on two feet on a trail while out walking. I immediately thought of walking on two feet. I went to find him. This was just a few hours after his encounter. I couldn't find him anywhere. The following day, I asked around as to where he was. He's gone, a guy said. What do you mean gone? Gone back to his regiment. I knew straight away why. I later found the guy who told me about this. He just didn't want to talk about it, so I left it there. It was September. I remember this well because I lost two of my best friends and I was feeling very down and lost. It was a bad time in my career for me. I decided to go for a drive, a weekend break. I had an old pickup truck and just drove, not really going anywhere in particular. I stopped for a break in a beautiful area not far from Medicine Lodge, Alberta. I had been on the road for two days, sleeping in the back of the pickup. I had decided to go for a walk on a trail along a tree line. I walked about a hundred yards away from the tree line, and I see a coyote just stop on the trail. I had never seen one so close. Our eyes met, and we just stared at each other. I suddenly feel uncomfortable. The coyote keeps glancing back and forth from the tree line. I'm really feeling anxious, not because of the coyote, but what's in the tree line? The coyote moves backward and forward, then just disappears into the grass. I'm left staring at the trees. Something is telling me to come closer. I can't explain this, but my head's telling me no. So I don't know how long I was there, but I'm so scared. I've never felt so much fear. To the point where I felt sick, I slowly walked backward, keeping my eyes on the tree line. I then turned and ran like a bad dream. I got in my pickup and never looked back. I still think about it to this day. What was in those trees? The months go by and then my battalion comes over for an exercise. One night while out I was with another mate. We were parked on a hill overlooking a large bowl down below where a platoon of men were all sleeping. It was around 2.30 in the morning, clear skies. You could see a good distance without using any aids. My friend was asleep. I noticed a group of coyotes down below. It looks like they were looking for a free meal. I'm thinking, is this what happens when someone feels they're being dragged in their sleeping bags? Could a coyote have that much strength? I watched them for a while, getting bolder by the minute. Then suddenly their body language changed. Four of them ran in one direction while one was just standing there looking up the hill. I looked through my night vision. Then, all of a sudden, three human-type figures just stood up, one after the other, all of different sizes. The first thing that stood out to me on adjusting my sights is that I could clearly see that the largest one was a Bigfoot. No doubt about it. It was standing at nine feet tall, and the second one was around seven and a half feet tall. The other one was six feet in height. I looked at my mate, still snoring away, and just left him to it. The details on the tallest Bigfoot were easy to see. Wow, so big. I could see his eyes. They were all looking in my direction, then just turned and walked down into another valley. I could see the hair swaying on his arms, even the calf muscles. I'm just smiling to myself. To me, this was the last piece of the puzzle. I had recently told my daughter about this. She believes me. There are so many people that know about these creatures, especially where I was. It's common knowledge. I think about them every day. I'm glad I saw them, and I've always believed that they existed. Some friends and I used to go exploring in the woods. We were all insomniacs and never slept, and we'd even walk around when it was night with flashlights, obviously. We'd wander around until we got tired and then turn around. Dumb, I know, but we were young and thought we were invincible, and we also grew up out there and knew the area really well. Well, one day we get really deep in. We've been hiking for over a few days, obviously have taken breaks to rest and eat. We'd been planning this, but we were in the part of the woods we'd never been before. No one really went in this part because there's a rumor it's haunted. There's no particular reason why it's haunted. People just say it is, and everyone stays away from it. So obviously that meant the five of us needed to check it out. 
We've been hiking for a few hours again, and we stumble upon this compound. I don't know what else to call it. It was a bunch of huge brick buildings. I mean, hundreds of them. They were all falling apart and caving in, overgrown with ivy, but there weren't any signs anywhere. We decided to check it out. Some of the buildings are pretty unsafe. The floors have caved in, but we're so fascinated wondering WTF is this place until we start to notice something really weird about it. It's these huge buildings, but there are no bathrooms, no kitchens, no closets, just rooms. Just a ton of rooms in all the buildings. They all have chimneys, but there's no fireplace, except a huge incinerator room that leads into a smaller incinerator room that has like a fake door that leads into an even smaller room with some teeth. We start getting a little freaked out, but we figure it's probably just animal teeth or whatever, so we move on. We decide to go in one last building because it's closer to where we came from and is more than a clearing so we can make a safe getaway if we need one. Now while we're here, the whole time it's been eerily quiet. The buildings have all been really dirty, but we start to notice it's also really weird that there's nothing left behind in any of these rooms. No furniture, no clothes, no odds and ends, no beer bottles or chip bags from squatters or teenagers. There's also windows on the outside of the houses, but no windows inside, like the rooms are just walls. We climb into this house through a hole on the side of the wall because the door won't budge. It's small and some of us have to squeeze in. I go in first and I immediately feel just weird, like bad. I tell them to hold on, but they make it sound like I'm being silly, so we laugh it off and they all come in, but then we all feel... We notice this is the first staircase we've been able to find. All the other buildings have three stories, but there were no staircases anywhere. This staircase is right to the side as soon as walk in. We all kind of look at each other like we want someone to say we should leave, but none of us want to be a lie, bitch. So we decide to go up the stairs. My friend and I go first to check it out, and again, it's just a bunch of empty rooms. But my friend and I start getting really creeped out. Our other friends are exploring and find this creepy-ass book sitting on like this beam in the middle of one of the rooms. And then we notice a door to the side, which is weird because there haven't been any doors. So we decide to open it, and immediately, we want to scream, but we suppress it. We know we can't. There's blood everywhere. It's a bathroom, a small, tiny bathroom with a tub. There's blood in the tub and the walls and the mirror and marks where it looks like someone was dragged but was trying to pull themselves away. We take some pictures before we get the F out uh, there and we turn around and our faces are just pale. Our friends ask us what's wrong and we say nothing. It's just a closet, but we know we need to leave immediately. We feel like we're being watched so we don't say what we saw. We continue checking around and saying how cool stuff is. We don't want to let up. We saw anything. But then our friends start going down the hallway, even though it's so dark down there, that their flashlights won't even work. We look at each other knowingly, and we grab them and say, Hey, let's check out this room first to the side because we missed it. So we put them closer to the stairs and us closer to the hallway in order to try and get them away from whatever we feel like is down there. Our friends are clueless and peek into the other empty room while my friend and I hear something move, something definitely human. I can't describe it, but I know it wasn't an animal. It's like a shuffle across the floor and almost a whisper. Our flashlights all start to go out one by one, which we think is weird, but we're telling our friends is just probably because of the batteries. We tell our friends we gotta go check out that room we missed downstairs first before we come back up here and check out the cool hallway. My friends don't know what's going on, so they start going down the stairs. A marble rolls down the hallway. One. Single. Marble. We all freeze. We see a big hunting knife downstairs that wasn't there before. You can see part of the room downstairs from upstairs. By this time, my friend knows something is wrong. Something creaks. We shout, run. We run down the stairs. But we all have to fit through the tiny hole, but something is blocking it. We're freaking out. We hear laughing. 
My friend and I break the glass on the door and kick through the rotten wood, but it's still a smaller, just bigger hole. We send them through. Then my friend goes. I'm in the doorway. I look up. I see a sliver of two or three figures in different parts of the house. I see a blade in one of their hands. We all book it. I mean, we ran faster than I've ever run in my life. We didn't stop for hours. We just kept running and running and running. We told our friends not to stop. We said we have to keep going. Eventually, all of a sudden, we just felt this weight lift off our shoulders. It was like the woods even got lighter, more beautiful. We slowed down. We kept walking for a while until we were absolutely positive and we went through some riverbeds to throw off our tracks and set some fake ones. Our friends had no idea what was going on, so we finally tell them that someone was in that house or building or whatever and was about to straight up murder us or do something worse and that we had found someone's murder bathroom. We show them the pictures and they start freaking out and are upset. We didn't show them even though they admit they would scream, which would for sure given us away. We all were silent the rest of the way out because we were so scared. We finally make it out a while after as the sun is rising and we call the police, but they don't believe us. We were just teenagers at the time. We can't even tell them where it was because we stumbled upon it and we were so freaked out. A few days later, there's a fire in the woods. They find some remnants of structures and a few buildings are left standing, but not the one we were in and no evidence of someone living there, but everyone in town thought it was weird but in a cool way, except us, obviously. The police said if anyone was there, it was probably just a buck they were skinning and that's all. But I know it wasn't. My friends and I have never talked about it again. It's kind of like an unspoken rule, and we never go to those part of the woods, not even in that general direction. As a park ranger in Yellowstone National Park for many years, I never anticipated the terrifying encounter I had one fateful night. With darkness surrounding the vast wilderness, I embarked on my routine patrol, oblivious to the horrors that awaited me. The night was unusually quiet, a thick mist veiling the towering pines and casting eerie shadows on the forest floor. Venturing deeper into the park, my gaze caught an unmarked trail, beckoning me with intrigue and curiosity. Unable to resist its mysterious allure, I ventured into its uncharted depths. The path led me away from the familiar track, winding through dense vegetation and twisted trees. Silence hung heavily, broken only by the rustling of leaves beneath my boots. I couldn't shake the feeling of trespassing in an ancient realm, untouched by humanity. As I ventured further, a bone-chilling coldness settled around me, causing the hair on my neck to stand on end. The dense canopy blocked the moonlight, plunging me into an impenetrable darkness. It was then that I heard a low, guttural growl that reverberated through the stillness. My heart raced as I scanned the surroundings, searching for the source of the ominous sound. Amidst the shadowy undergrowth, I caught sight of a towering figure resembling Bigfoot, its massive frame blending with the darkness. Fear gripped me, threatening to immobilize my every move. Instinct surged within, urging me to escape the clutches of this cryptid creature. I attempted to retrace my steps, but the winding trail seemed to morph, guiding me deeper into its lair. The creature pursued me with a disturbing grace its elongated limbs propelling it effortlessly through the underbrush. Its hot breath grazed my neck, its thunderous footsteps closing in. Desperation flooded my veins as I desperately sought a means of defense. In a moment of clarity, I reached for my rifle, hands trembling with adrenaline. With unwavering determination, I aimed, fired, and unleashed a flurry of bullets at the advancing beast. It howled in pain, an otherworldly cry that reverberated through the night before vanishing into the depths of the woods. Gasping for breath, I collapsed to the ground, overwhelmed by the weight of the encounter. Sweat drenched my brow as I realized the magnitude of what I had witnessed. The memory of that cryptid creature lurking in the darkness would forever be etched in my mind. 
Yet as I sat there shaken and alone, a nagging thought consumed me. Who would believe my account? Last year in northwest Florida, I was out hunting the swamp from a kayak. I had stayed out longer than I had wanted and went into the swamp further than I wanted. As darkness started creeping on me, I had a huge owl sweep down on me and almost hit me. It was absolutely silent. I never heard it until it had almost made contact with me. That started the puckering of the anus. After I somewhat calmed down from that, I noticed that a deafening silence had come over the swamp, completely unusual. Then it started. As I was paddling, I noticed a sound off in the distance. It was a faint sound of drums and people singing. Now where I was, it was many miles in a swamp with one way in and many miles to any other access to solid land. As I sat and listened, it became obvious to me that I was hearing music and chanting of Native Americans. I sat listening for quite some time. It was the only sound in the entire swamp. Then as quickly as I had noticed it, it had stopped. I paddled on in without any other sounds for the rest of the trip. Some years back, I was out deer hunting in southern Illinois. As usual, I was up and in the field by 3.30 a.m. I had scoped out my spot the day before and taped off some trees with fluorescent tape to help guide me through the dark well that plan didn't work for shit. So here I am walking around this forest in pitch blackness. I thought for sure I knew where I was going, but I got myself all turned around. I was in my teens at the time, so I slightly began to panic. Thankfully, my pops taught me that if you ever find yourself lost in the darkness of the woods, just pop a squat and stay there until dawn. When dawn broke, I was able to see my deer blind was only ten or so yards from where I was at. It's not necessarily creepy, but that feeling of being totally lost in unfamiliar woods is extremely nerve-wracking. <laughs> Listen closely for what I'm about to tell you is true and highly classified. I risk my freedom by revealing this, but the world needs to know. My name is John, and I was a part of a Navy SEAL team led by a remarkable leader named Bernie. Our mission took us to a remote village in Serbia, suspected of harboring pro-Russian terrorists. Little did we know that the horrors we would face there would defy explanation. As we infiltrated the village under the cover of darkness, our objective was clear. Gather intelligence and neutralize any threats we encountered. The villagers, at first glance, seemed ordinary, welcoming us with open arms, providing us with food and shelter. They insisted that there were no terrorists in their midst, claiming to be simple, peace-loving people. We let our guard down, taking a moment to relax and replenish our strength. We conversed with the villagers, trying to gain their trust, while secretly plotting our search for any signs of the suspected terrorists. Nightfall would be our cover, allowing us to move undetected through the shadows. But as midnight approached, a piercing, otherworldly screech shattered the tranquility. We rushed outside, our hearts pounding in our chests, only to witness a sight that would haunt our nightmares. The villagers, once seemingly ordinary, transformed into grotesque creatures, resembling the very essence of vampires from our darkest folklore. Fear gripped our hearts as we realized the dire situation we were in. The creatures sensed our presence, their eyes burning with an insatiable hunger. Without hesitation, we grabbed our weapons and unleashed a torrent of bullets upon them. The night was filled with a cacophony of gunfire and the chilling screams of the unnatural beings. In the midst of the battle, we lost three of our own, brave Navy SEALs who fought valiantly but succumbed to the overwhelming force of the creatures. Their sacrifice weighed heavily on us, fueling our determination to survive and complete the mission. When dawn finally broke, we cautiously ventured outside our hearts heavy with grief and disbelief. The village lay empty, devoid of life. It was as if the horrors of the night had vanished with the rising sun, leaving no trace behind. In the aftermath, we made a solemn pact. 
we vowed to keep our lips sealed, never uttering a word about the supernatural horrors we had encountered. The truth was too far, fetched too dangerous to disclose. Our words would be dismissed as madness, our credibility shattered. We, the remaining Navy SEALs, shouldered the burden of this secret, carrying it with us through the years that followed. Each of us knew that the truth could imprison us, not behind enemy lines, but within the confines of our own government's walls. Me, my fiancé, his sister, and her boyfriend had hiked up maybe two, three miles to a spot where we could chill and camp for the night. After we had had a few many drinks and had a good time, we fell asleep in our two separate tents. I slept like a baby through the night next to my fiancé, who also slept like a rock. Once we woke up, we cleaned up and gathered everything. We headed back down the trail and got in the car to grab some breakfast. We stopped in a McDonald's attached to a gas station or convenience store and sat down, hungover as hell and tired. My fiancé's sister's boyfriend, that's a mouthful, was having a sip of his coffee and turned to me. Dude, you were up late as hell last night. You good? I just looked at him and didn't know what he meant. I had fallen asleep at the same time as everyone else. He claimed he saw me in between the tents when he got up to take a piss around two in the morning. His smile immediately faded when I told him that. I felt a massive chill go through my body. I wasn't sure who or where what he'd seen, but it wasn't me, and I know that much. I was out for a day hike in the Hudson Valley in New York. My friend and I are probably about three miles into the woods on a section of the trail surrounded by absolutely nothing but shitloads of trees. No breaks in them or anything really, and it was a relatively flat section after just coming down from the summit. Off in distance, not too far from the trail, there was a perfectly inflated red balloon tied the trunk of a tree. We hadn't seen a single other person on the trail all day, and the forest was eerily quiet, too. It looked like the area hadn't been disturbed at all. No signs of footprints or other people being on that section of trail. It just gave me the creeps. Even now, when I hike that same trail, I get goosebumps and an eerie feeling when I go through that section. To my knowledge, it's not haunted and nothing happened there, either. So, yeah, just a random, perfectly inflated red balloon tied to a tree. Me and my friends were hiking in Hoosier National Forest, which is a massive forest around Bloomington, Indiana. This R is full of hillbillies and rednecks, so when we looked at the map and saw houses, we knew what we were in for. The first encounter we had was a man with a swisher suite in his mouth, walking down one of the foothills with close to eight dead possums. Not even in traps, they were just on his back. The second encounter we had was with these people walking around with a confederate flag. As we walked up the foothill, we heard these guys talking about how they didn't like all the tourists because they were bringing too many Mexicans the entire time as we walked past. They were waving the flag and chanting random shit the entire time. The last thing we saw was close to the end when near the lake we saw these people near a den or something on the shore of the water, waving around a dead raccoon with blood dripping from it. I still don't know what they were doing. That hike leaves me with so many questions. About 15 years ago, I was running cats in January, and there was a hard to get to block that. If the river was frozen, the cats and hounds would cross and end up in no man's land that was really tough to access. If you didn't want to go swimming in January, I had been in this spot once before a couple years earlier, and the chase broke up, and I was able to call my dogs out. It was always pretty rare that they ended up crossing the river. They came running back out. One had a minor injury from what looked like a stick, but I didn't think too much of it as they get beat up a little running through the brush. Fast forward a few years later and I have a great race going. 
but they went cross-country like a bat out of hell and right to the river. I can tell they crossed into no man's land, and I hike in to make sure. I look, and the ice is really terrible, so I can't follow. I give it about an hour, and the dogs go out of hearing and are sort of circling one spot, but not treeing. This goes on for another 30 minutes or so, and I decide I need to go in. I get to a hill and call a friend who lives nearby to see if I can borrow his snowmobile. To save me about five miles of walking in time if something weird is going on, he says no problem. So I grab the sled and go in, coming from another direction. That is an old logging road. I'm able to get within about one half miles of the dogs and get to hiking and closer to where the dogs are. As I snowshoe in, I could tell one of my dogs ran to the snowmail right away, which is fine. I knew he would stay with the machine. I hike into the other two, and they are running all over, but not really doing anything. But I see them covered in blood. I call them over, and both dogs have single puncture wounds about as big as my finger and perfectly round. One dog has it in her chest, and the other in the rear part of her rib cage. I call them over and we start hiking back to the snowmobile. I can hear my third dog howling where the machine is parked. I get closer and I can see my male dog standing on the snowmobile seat and blood running out of his chest. He also has a perfectly round puncture. I get all three dogs to sit on the snowmobile and I ride out back to my truck. They're bleeding like crazy all over the machine in the front of my hunting coat. And Pants is also now soaked from having a dog riding on my lap. I get the snowmobile back to my buddy, and he sees the dogs and is wondering what the hell happened. And his snowmobile has blood everywhere. I give the dogs what antibiotics I have, plug the holes a little, and get them to the vet wondering if they have been shot or what the hell happened. The vet looks the dogs over and is clueless, just says they were obviously punctured with something. But whatever it was didn't break off inside or stay put, and it was clean, so something likely man-made. I tell my buddy about it, and that I'm really clueless, but something weird went on back there. Drove me nuts, we got significant snow that night, so it covered up most of their tracks. But I was able to track where they went and found nothing obvious that they would have run into, and no human tracks anywhere. There is, however, deep snow, so there is a pretty deep trough where the cat and dogs ran, and it would be easy for tracks to blend into that with fresh snow covering them. Fast forward a year and a half later, my buddy who let me use his snowmobile is hunting bear in that same area with some friends. The bear crosses the river into no man's land, and the dogs end up deep into the woods there, in exactly the same area circling all over but not treeing. They figure out a way to hike into the dogs, get in there in six. Bear dogs are running around with perfectly round puncture wounds bleeding everywhere. Take them to the vet. Vet says no idea what happened. Clean hole like somebody just ran up and speared them. It was the end of deer season, and I had just finished up an evening hunt. As I made my way back to my truck, I switched on my headlamp's red light and tried to walk quietly. I didn't want to startle any deer or other wildlife that might be nearby. The moon was out, casting a pale glow over the woods. I walked along the road, taking in the eerie beauty of the night. As I walked, I saw something glowing off to the side of the road. My curiosity was piqued, so I approached the object cautiously. As I got closer, I could see that it was the embers of a fire. I couldn't see anyone around, but I knew that someone had trespassed on the property to build a fire there. I felt a shiver run down my spine. What kind of person would do something like that? I tripled my pace back to my truck, my heart racing. I threw my gear in the back and peeled out of there as fast as I could. I drove home, trying to shake off the feeling of unease that had settled over me. As I drove, I started to think about what had happened. Why had there been no smoke? Why had someone built a fire right off the road where they could easily be seen? Then, as I replayed the events in my mind, it hit me. There had been a silver Myler balloon off the road, and my headlamp's red light had reflected off it, creating the illusion of a fire. 
I couldn't believe how foolish I had been. My fear had gotten the best of me, and I had let my imagination run wild. I felt a sense of relief wash over me, knowing that I had not stumbled upon some sinister plot or nefarious trespasser, but at the same time I felt embarrassed by my own reaction. I had let my fears get the better of me, and I had let my guard down. It was a lesson that I wouldn't soon forget. From that moment on, I vowed to always approach things with a level head and to never let my imagination get the best of me again. My name is Glenn, and I'm a park ranger at the Warm Springs Reservation in Oregon. I have seen some strange things in my time, but what happened last week left me completely bewildered. My mother-in-law, who lives on the edge of the reservation, called me one day and said she had found some strange tracks in her backyard. I drove out to her house and examined the tracks. They were about 17, 18 inches long and looked like they had been made by a giant barefoot creature. I was skeptical at first, but then I noticed that the tracks were spaced much farther apart than any human could manage. I started to get a sinking feeling in my stomach. What if it was true? What if there was a dogman out here? Later that day, I received another report from a local resident. They had seen a black bear running off the road into the brush with a dogman chasing it. I couldn't believe it. I had heard stories of werewolves chasing down prey before, but I had never actually witnessed it myself. I decided to investigate further and went out to where the bear had been last seen. As I approached the area, I could smell a terrible stench. When I got closer, I saw the remains of the bear. It had been shredded apart as if something had torn it limb from limb. There was no sign of any other animals or humans around. It was just me and the gruesome scene in front of me. I was starting to feel really uneasy. What kind of creature could have done this? Was it really a dogman? I had to find out. I spent the next few days searching the area, setting up cameras and traps, hoping to catch a glimpse of whatever was out there. One night I heard something outside my cabin. It sounded like heavy footsteps, much heavier than any human could make. I peeked out the window, but all I could see was darkness. I stepped outside with my flashlight, and suddenly I heard a loud roar that echoed through the trees. I was frozen with fear, and then I saw it a huge, dark figure standing in the shadows. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was at least eight feet tall, covered in shaggy black fur, and its eyes glowed with an otherworldly light. It stared at me for what felt like an eternity, and then it turned and ran away into the night. I never saw the creature again after that, but I knew that I had witnessed something incredible. I reported everything to my superiors, but they dismissed it as a bear attack. They didn't want to create a panic among the local residents. I still think about that night often, wondering what else is out there in the forests and mountains of the Warm Springs Reservation. The dogman may be just a legend to some, but for me, it's a reality that I will never forget. My mom called me late at night last year, freaking out. She was home by herself and completely terrified. As she made her way down the hall to her bedroom, she was suddenly met W.A. loud, weird, high-pitched whistling coming from her open bedroom window. She was frozen with fear. When I tried to reason with her that it could have been an owl or something of that nature, she stayed adamant that it couldn't be, because whatever it was, she could tell it was pushed up against her window screen. And since her windows were a good seven feet off the ground with no ledge whatsoever, it just didn't make any sense. She could tell it wasn't human, whatever it was. I have no problem believing it could have been something unexplained, since I honestly could write a chapter book of the extremely odd supernatural things I've experienced in my life. When I was around 15, me and my friends were driving around going to all the haunted places around the basin. It was getting close to Halloween, so as is tradition, we were all trying to scare each other. First we went to a place called the Haunted Woods. This is an actual business, not a place in the woods. 
Then we went to an abandoned hotel near the Ute Reservation. Nothing of significance happened there. We didn't see or hear anything, and we were just goofing around and having fun. Then the driver says we were going to Skinwalker Ranch. I had never heard of Skinwalker Ranch, but I had heard plenty of stories of skinwalkers. I was intrigued at first, but as we dropped down the hill back behind the property, a feeling of total dread settled on me like a heavy blanket. Everyone in the car got more and more quiet, like they were feeling the heaviness too. I don't think we should go here. I spoke softly. Oh, we're going, the driver announced. There's no moon tonight and no flashlights allowed. He continued, I will just stay in the truck then. I have a really bad feeling and I don't want to go. I spoke again. You aren't staying in my truck alone, now get out, he said rudely. I got out of the truck and looked over at my best friend. Her face was white and her eyes were wide and round, and I knew she felt the same way that I did. We shouldn't be here, the driver of the truck said that this was the back end of the huge ranch. I wouldn't have believed him that this was really Skinwalker Ranch if I didn't feel that it was in every nerve ending of my body. He walked over to an ancient post and pole fence, undid the loop of wire holding up a small gate and laid it on the ground. There was an overgrown two-track road leading up into the darkness, and we followed as he led us up it. The horrible feeling of dread was almost overwhelming, and I felt like I was going to be sick. I wanted to go running back to the truck, but had a deep fear that something would pounce the moment I left the safety of the group. We weren't laughing and joking here. That heaviness was weighing on all of us, and we walked silently through the dark. As we walked, I tried to keep my eyes on my feet, but I would occasionally glance to either side of the two-track road. Each time I did, I would see a huge black mass out in the tall grass. I told myself it was just a cow, but each time I looked, it was in the same spot off to the left, following our journey to the old homestead. Finally, the driver and leader of our foolish expedition stopped and said that we were almost to the old homestead, that we needed to stay quiet in case the owners were around. As he turned to start walking again, a growl leapt from the darkness, and he stopped and took a step back. He wasn't our fearless leader anymore. His voice shook as he told us it was time to head back to the truck. We walked a little ways back, and then one of our group said they needed to use the bathroom. We stopped by a small stream running along the south end of the property. I was smoking and talking to one of my friends about how relieved I was that we were leaving. I glanced down at the stream at the same time my friend did, just in time to see a black figure emerging from the water. It was not a cow. It was not a coyote. It looked like a too skinny and too tall man. We both screamed and ran back to the road. That was the last straw for everyone, and we all ran the entire way back to the truck. Now I know that is eerie, but kind of uneventful. Have no fear. My story isn't over yet. A few months later, this adventure had slowly left my mind. I had started to convince myself that the figures in the darkness were just cows, and that it probably was just the dark running water playing tricks on my eyes, making me see things emerging from the water that weren't really there. My best friend had come over to my house to sit outside, bullshit, and smoke cigarettes. We did this pretty frequently. Like I said in my last story, we lived in the middle of nowhere. So dumb things like this were about as much fun as we could have. So we are sitting in her car just across the road from my house. Her car is pointed towards the town park, which was just about a block away from my house. There are no other houses on the way to the park, so with the street lamps on at the park, you can basically see everything up there. Oh, look a deer, my friend says suddenly. I could see a set of glowing eyes on the very far end of the park. Oh, yep, there it is, I reply. We watch it as it slowly walks towards the center of the park. In this spot, it is a huge metal slide or jungle gym thing that is probably 10, 12 feet tall. As the deer is walking, I notice that for some reason, I can't make out any features of the deer. It seems to always be just out of reach of the street lamps that are dotted throughout the park. The deer is right next to the slide when suddenly it stands up. The eyes that we were watching are suddenly even with the platform of the slide, which would make this deer 10, 12 feet tall. 
Then it starts to walk standing on its hind legs. Me and friend both started panicking. What the F is it? That's not a deer. We keep watching this extremely tall creature cross the park when my friend decided we're driving up there. She locks the doors and we head towards the park. When we were almost there, the eyes had crossed the street and went into the neighborhood across from the park. By the time we got there, whatever it was had vanished. Another few months go by. The event had definitely rattled us and there was no convincing ourselves that it was a deer. Deer do not walk on their hind legs, and they are not ten feet tall. One night, I'm at the same friend's house. This friend lived smack dab in the middle of huge farmland. All around her were pastures. It was very peaceful most of the time. We had spent the night watching movies and hanging out. I went and started my car, and we were smoking together on her porch before I left. We were just chatting when suddenly her eyes leave my face and look behind me and her eyes grow wide. I turn to look and see two glowing red eyes just past the fence into her neighbor's pasture. What the F is that? I manage to squeak out. I don't know, she whispers back. The eyes remained fixed on us for about 30 seconds, then turned to the left, blinked and vanished. We both ran back in the house. I didn't dare go home for another 45 minutes. If my car hadn't been already started, I probably wouldn't have left at all. A couple of years after these events, I was speaking with a Ute tribal member that I worked with, and she said something that gives me goosebumps to this day. She told me it isn't what's on the ranch that you should be afraid of. It's what follows you when you leave. I am convinced that something followed us from Skinwalker Ranch, and those terrifying events was something warning us to never go back. I never did, and I never will. I used to work on the north slope of Alaska in the oil industry. The work we were doing required us to travel far out into the Alaska Petroleum Reserve, which is basically just untamed tundra wilderness for hundreds of miles. The oil companies would build these long ice roads in the winter that would lead to exploration drilling pads. Our job was to go out after they finished the initial drilling and test rock formations for their oil producing qualities. It was mid-January, the sun hadn't quite come up yet, and when I say the sun hadn't come up, I mean in almost a month and a half, polar nights are intense. The particular well site we were traveling to was about 60 miles west of Alpine, Alaska. Deep in the wilderness, our job took a week, but we finished and were headed back to camp to finish our hitch and go home. At the beginning and end of the ice roads are guard shacks that you have to check in and out of for safety. No cell reception and radios work only up to a distance. If you don't check in or out in a set time, they come looking for you to ensure you're not a popsicle. It was about four in the morning, not that it mattered in the land of endless night, and we were halfway across the ice road. Travel was slow as the speed limit on the roads is only 25 miles per hour. When something appeared on the road in our headlights, it was a man in jeans, sneakers, and a hoodie jacket walking down an ice road in wilderness tundra at 4 a.m., and it was minus 20 degrees outside. It's not unusual for the local Inuit people to be out this far hunting. Maybe his snowmobile broke down and he's trying to get back to the guard shack. Seemed plausible. He didn't acknowledge us as our trucks rolled up next to him. He just kept shuffling forward. He didn't seem cold. His clothing, while totally not appropriate for this extreme weather, appeared warm and dry. We also noticed he wasn't Inuit, but Caucasian. I rolled down my window and asked if he needed any help and if he was okay. He still didn't acknowledge us, just kept shuffling forward. His face was completely blank, devoid of any thought or emotions. The other guys in my truck suggested that maybe he was in an accident and in shock. I continued rolling my truck alongside him as he trudged down the road, still trying to get his attention. Even in this extreme cold, I could occasionally get whiffs of a peculiar smell coming off him. He smelled uh, acidic, if that makes sense. There was just a lot about this guy that made the hair on my neck stand up. The guy behind me in the truck's crew cab had had enough of all this. He rolled down his window and reached out to grab the guy. 
He later said he was just going to try and shake him out of his stupor. Before my buddy's hand could reach him, though, this walking popsicle spun around and latched onto my buddy's outstretched arm. He glared at my buddy and then at me with this look of pure rage, not removing his hand from his arm. If emotions had a physical temperature, this guy could have melted the entire tundra that night. My buddy groaned in pain as he tried to get his arm free from Mr. Popsicle. At that moment, this guy starts screaming in our faces. There was so much hate and rage and anger in that scream. It was absolutely terrifying. I slammed on the gas and spun out on the ice for a second before the wheels caught and launched us forward. Popsicle dude still had a hold of my buddy's arm and was trying to pull him out of the truck. He was running alongside the truck while the other guys in the cab held onto my buddy to keep him inside. After several moments, if could only have been a few seconds at most, my buddy tore free from this guy and we hauled ass to the guard shack another 30 miles down the road. We checked in with the guards and reported what we had just seen. The guard was looking at us like we were pulling a prank, but policy said they had to check it out regardless. My buddy's arm was sore, and when he pulled back his sleeve, there were noticeable bruises in the shape of a hand around his arm. We filed a report with a guard, and we were told to head back to our camp. None of us really wanted to talk about what happened, and it was a quiet drive the rest of the way. We flew home the next day. The next time we saw the guard at the shack, we asked him if they ever saw Mr. Popsicle on his patrols. He told us they searched up and down that ice road for a solid 12-hour shift and saw nothing, not even tracks in the snow leading off the road. He told us it was a good prank and that he'd get us back for making him waste a shift driving around. But it wasn't a prank. Who would make up a story like that? And who would willingly bruise their arm for a dumb prank? We never got a satisfying answer to what happened that evening. I still wonder about that dude. If he even was a dude, the Alaskan tundra is a weird place, and that was just one of my many weird stories from my time up there. I'll work to write down more of my experiences and share them to the appropriate subs. True Story I used to stay at my grandparents' house a lot when I was younger. They wanted to help out and such. They owned a 40-50 acre farm with their house about a quarter mile into the woods. It was summer and we all were going to bed. I always have had trouble falling asleep and was the only one awake and was returning from the bathroom to join my cousin on the top bunk with me in the bottom. The bedroom had one window facing a light post my grandparents had installed. I was just covering myself up when I saw something cast a shadow against the window curtain. Once. Then twice it was fast, but I could tell there was something moving outside. I crawl out to the bed, hugging the floor, already scared. I was about a foot from the closed curtain with my eye just above the window sill. I stared out and nothing happened for a few seconds. Then I saw a figure cast a shadow onto the curtain. It looked like a big dog head. Long snout tail pointed ears. It stopped perfectly center of the window frame that slowly turned its head to face me. I froze, but it then raised up a few inch to show its shoulders. I can only describe it as a wolf head on a human body. Then it turned away and moved on. People said I was young. It was only a nightmare. It wasn't I remember it too vividly. I forgot to mention that this window was about five feet up from the ground. It was my mother's old room as a child, and when I asked her if she ever saw anything, she paused for several seconds, began to speak, shook her head, and stuttered out a no. She knew the folklore and refused to speak, and we dropped it, but I knew why she responded that way. Never mention them aloud. I can't explain this. I'm still scared to be alone at night there. Even typing this gave me goosebumps. My aunt and uncle were pretty rich. My uncle's family owned Kearns, and he designed airplanes for Boeing as a career. My aunt won the lottery, so between the two of them, they were loaded. They bought a large plot of land in Southern California that I would describe as 30% desert, 60% forest, 10% mountains. It was ridiculously hot and dry, 
but not so hard and dry that plants and trees couldn't grow. My cousin and I never had a shortage of places to explore. When we were kids, they were the only house for miles in any direction, so we had plenty, too, of woods to explore, small mountains to climb, and wildlife to experience. Because of the climate, we really only ever saw lizards, rattlesnakes, tarantulas, and coyotes. Can't say I ever saw a deer in those woods. That's why it seemed like such a desert. This story took place in 2003. Anyway, when I was 13 and my cousin was 14, we decided to see what was beyond a large hill we hadn't yet gone over. So we set off and at the other side of the hill we found a dirt path that looked like it had been carved through the brush by animals using it as a natural path. But we also saw deep but thin grooves in the dirt that showed the telling signs of a tire. A single tire. We deduced that it was probably a wheelbarrow, but there were no human footprints near it that indicated anyone was pushing it. So what the hell was? Being young and dumb, we followed the tire track and it led us down into what I could only describe as a natural cul-de-sac of rocky cliffs. The only way out was the way we came in or we had to climb the 60-foot cliffs on all sides of us. Trees grew here, and the ground was muddier, giving us a clearer look at the tire tracks. Still no other human footprints but our own. They were animal prints. Little imprints of claw marks that showed lizards had clearly been here. Coyote paws checkered the mud, and even the broken lines of snake tracks that alternates between thin and wide the usual fauna we saw had all seen this place. We found the wheelbarrow just at the base of the cliff furthest from where we had come in, but that isn't all we found. We found clothes all over the place, some clean, some filthy, some for older people, some for children, still no human footprints. We also found toys, nothing mainstream. These were handmade, carved from wood or chipped from stone. They were pretty detailed figurines, still no human tracks. We found shoes, but no shoe print, no bare feet. We also found a hole in the cliff. It was a near-perfect circle that went about 30 feet into the cliff. We always brought flashlights on these trips, so my cousin shined his flashlight into the hole. The rock all around us that made up the cliff was red and orange, but the bottom of the hole was covered with a gray dust and the back of the hole ended against a wall of rock of the same gray color. It was the same color as the figurines we had found, and I went and grabbed one to try and compare, just curious to see if it was carved from the same stone, because whoever would drill 30 feet into a red cliff to get to some boring gray rock in the middle, just to carve little toys out of it. Well, they were odd, but dedicated. Then we finally took notice of the size of the hole we were staring into. It was small, really small. At the age of 13, I was only 5 feet 4 and really thin, and there was no way I would ever be able to squeeze into that hole. We contemplated what the hole was for, since clearly nobody strong enough to carve into the wall could fit in there. As we tossed ideas around for a couple minutes, we stopped at the very clear sound of a whimper followed by the clear clatter of rock on rock like throwing a small stone at a boulder. From inside the hole, my cousin chained his light back in as fast as he could. Nothing, still an empty, dusty hole in a cliff, except for one rock about 15 feet and that we both were pretty sure was not there before. So something had thrown a rock out way from inside the empty hole. I still had one of the figurines in my hand. So I threw it hard toward the back of the hole, and the very instant it met the back wall, we saw an arm and hand shoot out from around a corner we didn't know was there, and snatch the figurine and pull it into the unknown. The arm was human-ish. Now we only saw the arm for a split second as it grabbed the figurine and withdrew in an instant, but we both noticed a few details that we confirmed to each other. It looked like a small child's arm, but it was multicolored. It was a pale blue along the underside of the forearm and bicep, but the same reddish color of the rock around it everywhere else. Any hands were bigger than should have been on an arm of that size. 
but the most noticeable was an unnatural bend in the arm that made it look like it had a second elbow. The arm seemed to unfold to snatch the figurine like a scorpion tail stretching to strike. We got the hell out of there fast. We went back and told my uncle about it, and he decided to come back with us to check it out. The way we described it, he was worried it might be a runaway child or a human trafficking pit stop. When we got there with him, all the clothes we had found were gone. The wheelbarrow was gone. Still no footprints except for ours. The only thing that remained were the figurines of stone and wood. We showed my uncle the hole. He shined a light into it and saw nothing, although he was curious as to what the hole's purpose was. It wasn't natural, obviously. We grabbed one of the figurines and threw it to the back of the hole again. Nothing. No arm to grab it this time. My uncle didn't believe us about what we had seen, but after looking around the area, he found some things we hadn't. There were rock carvings in the cliffs, illegible letters and drawings. The trees had scars that looked like stab marks. Some of the bark on other trees was shredded or beaten to splinters. He called the cops, and we made a final trip back to show them the spot. This time, my cousin brought some of his own stuff. A remote control car with a video camera taped to the top. We got back to the place with a couple of officers, and they looked around. They, too, were most curious about the hole. We made another attempt at throwing a figurine into it, but again, nothing happened. As the cops were talking to my uncle... We all heard that same whimper my cousin and I had heard when we were alone. My uncle, the cops, and my cousins and I all heard it coming from the hole. The cops shined their light into it and saw nothing. We threw another figurine. Nothing. So my cousin pulled out his little remote control car with the camera taped to it and put it in the hole and drove it to the end, turned it to look in all directions, and then drove back. We all looked at the footage. In the back of the hole where we had seen the arm shoot out to grab the figurine, there were dozens of similar figurines, all standing and arranged in neat lines and formations, all looking in the same direction. But the hole ended there. There was nothing beyond that. Another dead end, or so it seemed. The whimper had no source. We all got out of there, and the cops said they would look into it. The following morning, my cousin and I woke up to find one of the figurines sitting on the dresser of my cousin's room. He gave it to me. I still have it. It still freaks me out. I need to share this story with someone to unload the weight of the horrors I witnessed and to ensure that the memory of my companions is not forgotten. My name is Francis, and... I am the sole survivor of an ill-fated hunting trip that will forever haunt my nightmares. It all started like any other year, with a group of seasoned hunters gathering for our annual expedition into the remote forests of Texas. We were a tight-knit group bound by our shared love for the thrill of the trace and the camaraderie that came with it. Little did we know that this trip would be like no other we had experienced before. The first day began with promising signs. We encountered an elk and a bear, presenting us with opportunities to prove our skill and prowess. However, fate was not on our side, and we returned to camp empty-handed. Undeterred, we rallied for the second day, hoping that fortune would smile upon us. But as the hours ticked by, the forest remained silent, refusing to reveal its bounties to our eager eyes. Then on the third day, tragedy struck. As we set out once again, our group dispersed, each of us seeking our prey in different directions. Time slipped away, and after what felt like an eternity, I noticed an eerie silence settling upon the woods. It was as if the very essence of life had been sucked away, replaced by an ominous stillness that sent shivers down my spine. Curiosity got the better of me, and I ventured deeper into the forest, my senses on high alert. What I discovered next would forever sear itself into my memory. There, lying lifeless on the forest floor, was the body of one of our hunters. His life had been abruptly stolen by some predator, its savage claws leaving behind a gruesome testament to its brutality. As I knelt down to analyze the tragic scene, a distant scream pierced the air, echoing through the trees. Panic seized me, and I instinctively ran towards the source of the cry. 
What I stumbled upon next would forever shatter my soul. There, before my horrified gaze, lay another member of our hunting party, his body brutally torn and half-eaten. The carnage before me was beyond comprehension. In a state of shock, I scanned the surroundings, searching for any sign of the creature responsible for this horrifying bloodshed. And then it happened. A bone-chilling roar echoed through the forest, reverberating through every fiber of my being. I turned towards the sound, and there it stood. A cryptid, a creature resembling a werewolf or a dogman, its monstrous form etched into my mind forever. I was paralyzed with fear, frozen in place as the creature prowled before me, unaware of my presence. Time stood still for what felt like an eternity, my heart pounding in my chest, threatening to burst free. And then, as abruptly as it had appeared, the creature vanished into the depths of the forest, leaving behind only the echoes of its malevolent presence. In those harrowing moments, I made a silent vow never to hunt again. The thrill and the thrill alone would no longer hold any appeal for me. One time for my birthday, I decided to go to this lake or hiking area by myself. It was a horrible birthday already, which was why I went out alone to rejuvenate and have some time to myself. I noticed this guy talking to two older people. He was staring at me, but I just ignored it. I eventually decided to move on and thought nothing of it. Later on, I hear someone walking behind me. Figure it's nothing, until I notice it's the same guy who was staring at me earlier. This time he's alone, so I assume he wasn't with those people he was speaking with, and he was now following me. His pace increases until he catches up with me. Keep in mind, I'm on the trail that takes me back to my car, and I'm not even halfway there yet. The guy starts trying to talk to me and won't leave me alone. He asked me to get in his car and go somewhere with him. I don't remember where at this point. Now I'm scared and trying to hurry back to my car. He follows me the entire way back to my car. I just kept walking and got in and drove away. It was part of the Appalachian Trail. You hear about weirdos like that all the time. I just never thought it would happen to me or at this part of the trail. It's a super family-friendly place. I never went there alone again. My friends and I decided we wanted to trip on acid for the first time in the hills, and we were going to camp out for the night. It was me plus four of girls. We'll call them Eli, Sid, Madeline, and Nevely. Plus, we brought our male friend, Dylan, as a trip sitter. We borrowed a tent and drove like an hour to where Dylan said he had been before, and it was apparently a little private beach and a lake with ledges to jump from. By the time we got there, it was 7 p.m., but still daylight, and we set up camp and took our acid. It was fine while it was still daylight. When it started to get cold... We wanted to make a fire, but it turned out all the wood was wet, and we had no more lighter fluid because we wasted it all trying to get it going. Our friend Madeline and Dylan decided to walk back to the car to go get some supplies, but that left the rest of us in darkness with two phones on acid somewhere we had never been before. Fast forward, they got back, and we had a fire going for a while, and when it went out, we all laid back to look at the stars and listen to music. Then headlights popped up over top of this ledge that was to our right. We had to walk on foot just to get to this spot because of all the trees, so we had no idea how they were driving back there. We thought maybe it was the cops. It was a pickup truck, and it pulled up to the ledge and must have seen us. They somehow maneuver this truck down the ledge and get out, and it's a grown man and his grown son, I'm assuming, with either alcohol, vomit, or a mix of both on both shirts. The son is clearly belligerent, asking what we were doing out here while the dad stood by his truck door, silent but staring at us. He started asking if we've ever been to the bulldog or some crap, but I was so freaked out. We all were. None of us were talking to him except Madeline, who was acting like she was beyond messed up. We kept telling her to stop, but she just comes right out and is like, I'll sell my body for money. 
I swear to God I cannot make this up. I've taken acid plenty of times now to know she was just acting out because there's no way one tab made her lose control like that. Thank the Lord they weren't actual creeps, because when they heard that, they pretty much got the F out of there. We packed up as soon as we saw they were gone, leaving half our crap and noticing our tent somehow had made its way into the water and already floated halfway out to the lake. We walked back through the woods with two phone flashlights. One of my friends numbed to the rocks under her feet so she was trampling them and causing her feet to bleed. The whole night was just messed up. I forgot exactly where this was, but I took a trail that went through a bit of forest and undergrowth, then down a hill to a very beautiful lake. I was mostly alone on the trail. The people accompanying me were fairly far behind. I remember it was very quiet as well, nearly no noise except for the leaves quietly rustling in the breeze. About thirty feet away from the lake's edge, I paused to see nearly a dozen dead morning doves scattered beside the trampled path. No visible wounds, no bites, no gore, no obvious broken bones, and no decay or insects, because it seemed to have happened shortly before I arrived. They were just laying dead. It was pretty out of the way from habited areas as well, so I have no idea if they were poisoned by a jackass with a bird feeder, but it seemed an unlikely cause due to the area being so isolated. The silence combined with this scene made it feel very eerie. This happened to my dad and brother 16 years ago outside Fernley, Nevada. Long story short, two guys tried to murder them. The long version. So my dad and brother liked to go out into the desert at night and look for snakes. Tarantulas, just critters in general. One night they were up on a hill when they saw a truck driving by. My dad blinked his flashlight at them to signal they were up there. I don't know why he did this. Maybe so they didn't get ran over or something. Well, these individuals slammed on their brakes and started unloading rounds up toward them. My father smacked my brother to the ground and started screaming at them to stop. Didn't work. So the two of them, Army, crawled toward my dad's truck while these guys were still taking pot shots. It was super dark out, so they didn't know where my dad and brother were. When they eventually made it to the truck, it stalled out. So obviously the shooters heard it and started firing at them. They hid under the truck and waited a long-ass time for a break in fire because every time they got ready to run, shots would start going off again. I guess they got to the point where they agreed. Either we make a mad dash out of here, or these guys will eventually just come up and execute us. So that's what they did. They ended up running several miles back into town. A gas station clerk called the police, but nothing came of it. To this day, we have no clue who it was that tried to murder them, or how did they had so much ammo. We're talking hours of shots ringing out every couple of minutes. My father refused to ever go out in the Nevada desert again, though. Several years ago, I was guiding here in Idaho, and I had two older clients from the East Coast who had been best friends since kindergarten. They were both kind of scared of the woods, but 20-year-old me was not scared of anything. Well, I dropped one off at a stand on the evening, and I took the other guy to a different spot. When it got dark myself and the guy I was with went back to pick up the other guy, he was laying on the ground about 100 yards from the stand. I was like, hey, wake up, it's cold out, and we should be going. He just laid there, so I, I walked up and kicked his leg, and I realized his eyes were open. My heart started pounding super fast, and I leaned down and checked his pulse. No pulse. He's dead as a doorknob. I just turned to the other guy, and I was like, Well, do you want to stay here or go with me to the truck so we can call my boss on the CB? He wanted to stay with his friend. It was pitch black, and this guy was already easily nervous, so I'm surprised he wanted to stay there. Anyway, this spot is near a trail that people hike on occasionally, and ever since it seems like weird stuff happens there, 
I know several people that have seen and heard weird things within a mile of the spot. This guy died. I just avoid it anymore. I always thought it was weird that he was away from the stand, too, when I explicitly told him to stay in it till I came and got him. Not sure why he left it. Always listen to your guide. They have a reason for what they tell you to do. So here's another story that's quite a bit different than that one. Last year, I'm backpacking in the cabinets with my wife and my two younger sisters. We set up camp way up on a ridge about five miles into the wilderness boundary. At around midnight, I woke up because I heard some growling. It wasn't windy or anything. The growling was maybe a few yards from my tent, and I can hear some twigs snap. I'm getting nervous about this time, so I grab my Glock in one hand and my bear spray in the other and creep out the front of my tent and knock but my undies. There's a bright moon, but I couldn't see any critters. I got back in my tent. A few minutes later, I hear some more growling, but whatever it is is just walking around the tent because now it's in a different spot. It kept happening for hours as I laid there clutching my gun. In the morning, my sisters said that they didn't sleep much because they kept hearing growling and snarling. Apparently, something even brushed against their tent. I'm guessing it was a grizzly because I've been around black bears plenty and this sounded deeper and whatever it was wasn't scared of us. It probably just didn't like us being too near. It's den. I guess the takeaway from that experience is always have a gun and bear spray in grizzly country. In around September 1984, I was driving north along the Illinois River, north of Peoria, Illinois on Route 29. I had been seeing a number of cars pulled over with the folks all looking up in the sky. I finally got curious and pulled over myself. When I did, I observed a huge vulture or eagle-like bird. When I say huge, I mean it was the size of a Piper Cub or Tomahawk four-seat aircraft. It was dark brown or black, had the same sort of profile as an eagle or a beautio, tight bird, long broad wings, and a large tail. For an instant at first, I thought it may have been an ultralight aircraft as a landing field for them was not so awful far away. I did quite a bit of flying then, so I know how big airplanes are and how big they appear in the sky at various distances. This was no aircraft, though. As it effortlessly circled slowly above the river, I watched it for some time. Folks going by in their cars were also looking and pointing up at it. There are plenty of eagles, vultures, hawks, owls, etc. around there, and I know them when I see them. This was much, much bigger than a bald eagle. I raced back to my office, telling my co-workers what I had seen. Of course they teased me that I was smoking something. I watched the local news and read the paper for some time, but there was no mention made of it. But plenty saw it, I am quite sure. I've never seen anything like it since. I was out about 100 kilometers from the city last weekend camping with my telescope. I set everything up, start the photo timer, and go to take a nap in my truck camper while it does its thing. I wake up in a bit and go to check the time, and my, my phone is dead. I, I go to check the camera, and it's not taking pictures. The what was full battery is dead, so I can't see how long it has been or how many photos I've taken. I go to pack up my gear and sit down on the grass to start coiling up some cables. As soon as I sit down and stop moving, I start to hear faint music. Now my first thought is there is a couple farms around, so maybe someone's having a party and the sound is traveling. But it sounds like carnival music. It's not really something I could think of, someone playing in the middle of the night. Second, the music sounds like it has been slowed down and it does not have a steady beat. I can sort of describe how it sounded, but not how it felt, like this strange back-and-forth time dilation while also being a little fuzzy and pretty quiet. It didn't particularly sound like it was coming from any direction. There was just music playing. It made the hair stand up on the back of my back of my neck, and it just made me feel so uncomfortable. 
I've heard music off in the distance many times in my life, and the sound of it was just different. Anyway, I pack up half my stuff, pretty much run back to the truck and close all the windows in the camper so I can't hear anything and go back to sleep. Wake up in the morning and there's no music playing, and I'm sort of wondering if it was just some crazy dream, but I find my gear half packed up, so I have no idea. Maybe it was some half-asleep thing going on, but I could have sworn I heard it. Wish some of my electronics were charged, so I could have recorded it, and I have no idea what time it was at. I figure it was sometime between 1 when I went to sleep and 4 a.m. when it gets light out. Because of my experience, I now record my drives. Literally less than a year ago, I was on a drive from Roach, Nevada to Sandpoint, Idaho, riding us 95. My first time, it was 2 a.m. on a Sunday, so road was literally deserted for 20 minutes straight. Not one outside source of headlights for miles. I was hitting about 80 miles per hour most of the whole way with cruise control on. With Waze as my GPS, there was a report of an object on the road, and I planned accordingly to anticipate the object. As I approached, the object in question wasn't an object, but an animal. That looks to be consuming a carcass that was bright pink, similar to a large pig. The appearance of the animal did not look like anything else. It was in a squatting position, as of it had bipedal capabilities, but it was covered in dark brown fur. Keep in mind that I only had a glimpse of the animal, as my first reaction was to swerve out of the way and accelerate the hell out of there. I should have at least screenshot the way is you I on my phone. My mom and dad bought a house that was built in the early 1900s. The house was huge, two stories with an attic and basement. We were checking out the attic. I was near the chimney that ran up an outside wall from the first floor fireplace. I saw something, couldn't reach it, ran down and grabbed a poker from the fireplace, the kind with a little hook on it. The family is watching me try to retrieve what I saw. I had the tip of the poker about 12 inches below the floorboards, struggling to hook the object when it was literally ripped out of my hands. I was 20. Four at the time, and just out of the Navy, it took something powerful to rip it out of my grasp. Everyone saw my body jerk toward the floor. My mom yelled something incoherent, then total silence. We all just stared at the base of the chimney for probably ten seconds, trying to realize what the F just happened. Then, as one got the hell out of the attic, the poker was never retrieved. We learned from a neighbor that in the 1940s the lady of the house hung herself in the basement. Maybe it was her, maybe not. Who cares I don't go up to the attic? Flashback to 2007, I was roughly 20 years old. The drive was through a semi-rural area, a single lane, smooth road called Kennett Pike, Delaware. Route 52, which connects Pennsylvania to Delaware. Kennett Pike also connects to Devil's Road, where M. Knight filmed the village. It was typically an eerie commute, but due to me using it often, it never truly scared me. Girlfriend at the time was riding with me in the passenger seat of my old Jeep Grand Cherokee, and we were traveling back to Delaware after dropping off my best pal in Pennsylvania, who joined us to see a movie. It was 2 a.m. at the time. We had recently crossed the state line. Despite being young and stupid, I reduced my speed slightly due to the dense fog which we had quickly entered. Before I knew it, my heart was racing. I found myself swerving as to not hit a person. In the middle of the road, it was an apparition, like woman with long, thick gray hair, covered in worn white robes with a dim glow to her entire appearance. She was kneeling down, almost completely still at first, but her torso appeared to be slightly moving, and she was slowly rising. I didn't quite get a good look at her face, but perhaps that's what makes the fear linger on. I recall saying, holy shit, did you see that? To which my girlfriend agreed, nodding with an open mouth and wide eyes. 
Additionally, this girl I was dating at the time claimed to have a ghost living in a room of her family's home, a room which they would seldom enter. I've had a few paranormal encounters. I list the two worst ones here, both occurred in 2014. I have used our IGU before several months before this occurred. Both of these stories happened when I was in an extremely negative state of mind. I don't really know where to start from, but I'll try to explain what I think brought this on. Basically, one night I was having one of the worst nights of my life, self-inflicted. I kept thinking about all the negative things going on in my life. My girlfriend was sleeping with my friend at the time, despite him swearing he'd never do such a thing. Blah, blah. I broke it off. I had no friends. All the friends I had were fake, so I pushed everyone away. I felt like my life was falling apart. I sat outside for hours smoking cigarettes, being a depressive mess. I finally got myself to bed, dreading the fact I'd have to wake up and go on another day. Anyway, I wake up about 3-4 a.m. I'm an insomniac, so waking up late at nights around this hour is very common for me. I know witching hour, and I really needed to pee. I got up and took a whisk. I usually shut the door as I don't want to make noise to wake my sister or anything, but I just was in the mindset of, I don't give a AF about anything anymore. Anyway, I turn around after flushing to see this seven feet tall, huge, black hooded, red eyed being. It had no body or hands. It was just pure black, even more so inside of the robe, where the body should be. The best way to describe the red eyes would be red like your generic glowy red eye mammy. Best way to describe it, sorry. It turns around the corner of the hall towards me in an insanely fast manner as if it was printing, but it was very swift, as it seemed, like it was levitating or something. It had no feet or anything, and no bobbing movement like a person would be while running. As I'm about to walk out of the bathroom, it lunged at me with both hands of the robe stretched out towards me, and I had never felt fear so deep as I did in that moment. A huge shiver ran down my spine as I say, Oh, shit, with words, barely able to leave my mouth as I stutter and fall to the ground. With one knee and I look up to see nothing, absolutely nothing. I sprinted back to bed lights on Dr. Shutt and didn't sleep at all. Scary encounter, too. This happens a couple of months later. I wake up around 3 a.m. again, hardly able to see as no lights are on, and I see an outline of a little girl next to my bed standing there with both of her hands to her side. I take a second to realize it's a person or a ghost or something, and it has a white bed dress with long black hair over her face. She's still standing there. I freak out and start panicking. I throw a couple of hammer punches and swings with my hand as I refuse to look at whatever it is, frantically trying to turn on my light or grab my phone with my left hand swatting the table. I finally grab onto my phone and see she is still there as I shine my phone light on it. It vanishes as if nothing was ever there. I ended up falling back to sleep after the sunrise came up. Never saw it again. Sorry if I didn't write this well. I tried to describe everything in as much detail as possible. I have a couple more stories, but I think these two taught me a lesson and really pulled me out of my slump as I was terrified. I'd see that again. Feel free to question me or give advice below. It was the summer of 2019, and I found myself near Snow Lake in Washington State. As dusk settled in, I realized I was one of the few remaining visitors at the lake. The tranquility of the surroundings was interrupted when I heard my Japanese middle name being called out a name that is quite uncommon, even among Japanese individuals. It stopped me dead in my tracks. The voice seemed to originate from the opposite direction of where I'd come from. Initially, I thought it was merely a coincidence, someone sharing the same name as me. But as the voice called out again, and then once more, doubt turned into unease. My instincts kicked in, telling me that something was not right. 
I grabbed my friend and urged them to accompany me back to the parking lot before darkness consumed the landscape. With only our phone lights to guide us, we embarked on the final two miles of the hike in pitch black darkness. The whole experience was unsettling, and I vowed to only visit the area during daylight hours from that point on. Snow Lake had been a beautiful location, but the strange encounter left me wary. Over a year later, I learned of a chilling incident that occurred in the same area. A man named Brendan Nippon had gone missing along with his dog. He was a 37-year-old avid hiker, and despite extensive search efforts, not a single trace of him or his dog was ever found. There were speculations that he may have hiked further up the trail to Jim Lake, which was just under two miles away from Snow Lake. I had been to Jim Lake myself during the day, appreciating its breathtaking views. It's an open area, seemingly impossible to get lost in. The disappearance of Brendan Neppen struck a chord with me as I recalled my own eerie encounter near Snow Lake. It served as a grim reminder that even in the most stunning landscapes, there may be an underlying darkness hidden from view. The memory of that voice calling my name still lingers, a chilling reminder of the mysteries that lie within the wilderness. Let me share a story from the mid-80s that still gives me goosebumps to this day. It was during that time when my friend, our girlfriends, and I embarked on a road trip from Baltimore to Hampton Roads for a couple of Grateful Dead concerts. The concerts were a blast, and we were filled with euphoria as we made our way back home after the second show, which I believe took place on a Saturday or Sunday. Somewhere north of Richmond, in the desolate stretches of I-95, we decided to pull over and take a break. We found a secluded spot far enough off the road to relieve ourselves. The girls opted to go by the side of the car, while my friend and I ventured closer to the tree line. It was the middle of the night, and the surrounding area was shrouded in darkness. As we finished up, the stillness of the night was broken by a sudden and quiet whistle. It was that classic wheat woo sound, originating from the other side of the tree line. The moment the whistle reached our ears, a chill ran down our spines. We exchanged a glance of disbelief and fear, hastily zipped up and sprinted back towards the car. Our girlfriends were taken aback by our sudden urgency as we jumped into the car and sped away. They demanded an explanation, wondering what had happened. We decided to wait until we were a safe distance down the road before sharing the unsettling encounter with them. It was at that moment that we recounted the whistle from the other side of the trees, relaying our sense of alarm and the urgency to leave the area. The girls were equally shocked and disturbed by our experience. To this day, the memory of that night haunts us. We often speculate about who or what could have made that whistle in the darkness of the Virginia wilderness. Was it a harmless passer bee, or did it carry a more sinister intent? The unanswered questions and the feeling of unease have stayed with us ever since that night on the side of a 95. My name is Officer Jake Thompson, and I've carried a haunting memory with me since my childhood, an encounter with an unidentified creature that forever etched fear into my heart. That memory has fueled my obsession my unrelenting pursuit to solve the mystery of its existence. Years passed, and I became a seasoned cop, but the memory of that encounter never left me. And then one fateful night, a series of bizarre animal attacks gripped the city. The detail struck me with an eerie familiarity bearing a striking resemblance to the horrors of my childhood. Deep down, I knew that the creature had returned, Convinced of its reappearance, I assembled a team of fellow officers who had also experienced encounters with the unknown. We shared a bond forged by the terror that lurked in the shadows. Each member carried their own scars, haunted by their personal encounters with the enigmatic creature. Together, we vowed to face it head, on and put an end to its reign of terror. As we embarked on our hunt, tension simmered beneath the surface. The weight of our shared traumas tested our bonds, stretching them to their limits. 
Yet we pressed forward, fueled by a collective determination to uncover the truth and protect those we swore to serve. Night after night, we tracked the creature across the city, following the trail of bizarre animal attacks. With every step, the air grew heavy with anticipation and fear. The line between predator and prey blurred as we became both hunters and the hunted. Finally, we cornered the creature in an abandoned warehouse. A palpable tension hung in the air, each member of our team ready to face the ultimate test. But as the climactic showdown unfolded, the true strength of the creature revealed itself. With terrifying speed and brute force, it overpowered us, striking us down one by one. The very officers who had once stood by my side now fell victim to the creature's relentless assault. Blood stained the cold concrete floor as the echoes of our desperate struggle reverberated through the empty space. I fought valiantly, refusing to succumb to the creature's savagery. But in the end, I too became its prey. As my strength waned, I stared into the eyes of the creature, witnessing the culmination of a lifelong obsession. It had defeated me, the last one standing. In my final moments, as darkness claimed me, I realized the true nature of my pursuit. It had consumed me, blinded me to the inevitable cost. My obsession had led to the demise of not only myself, but also those I had come to consider family. As Officer Jake Thompson fell, another victim of the creature he had sought to defeat, the city remained shrouded in the terror of the unknown. The memory of our sacrifice would fade, but the creature would linger, a constant reminder of the darkness that exists just beyond the edges of our perception. And so my story ends in tragedy, a cautionary tale of how obsession and the pursuit of the unknown can devour even the strongest among us. The unanswered questions and the lurking fears would continue to haunt the city, a reminder that sometimes there are mysteries that should remain unsolved. Randy and I were passionate explorers drawn to the allure of wilderness secrets. Our favorite spot, Bigfoot Mountain, nestled near Ripple Brook Ranger Station, carried the mystique of cryptid encounters. Eager to uncover the truth, we embarked on our spring exploration, braving the snowy landscape. March greeted us with a chill, but our determination remained unwavering. Equipped and enthusiastic, we meticulously scoured the area, seeking any sign of Bigfoot. Weeks passed, and May brought our reward. One misty morning, a faint chattering sound halted us mid-hike. Anticipation surged as we scanned for movement. With cautious steps, we ventured deeper, attuned to every sound. And there it was, the unmistakable footprints of a massive creature. Excitement coursed through us, fully aware of the extraordinary presence. Undeterred, our curiosity propelled us forward. In June, I stumbled upon a secluded area adorned with deep systematic scratches, powerful claw marks, a clear sign of primal force traversing these woods. Fate had more in store during a solitary expedition. I reached a sunlit clearing. A hush fell and energy filled the air, and then a glimpse of movement among the ancient trees. Bigfoot emerged, a towering figure cloaked in matted hair. Time stood still as we locked eyes, captivated by its power and beauty. In that fleeting moment, fear, awe, and respect intertwined. Bigfoot observed me with ancient wisdom, and just as quickly as it appeared, it vanished, leaving me in profound wonder. I spent over 20 years working as a ranger in Northern Carolina where I encountered numerous strange and even gruesome incidents. During my time there, I discovered several lifeless bodies, thankfully all leading to the apprehension of the culprits by the police. However, it wasn't these killings that drove me to quit my job and never return. It was something inexplicable, something so peculiar that even now I question whether it was a mere dream, vision, or a genuine occurrence allow me to recount what I witnessed from the very beginning. It was the middle of scorching August, 
as the sun mercilessly beat down upon the ground. Few people visited the park during the day due to the obvious reasons. I detested leaving my guard hut to conduct a tour, as it would inevitably result in profuse sweating and feeling as if I were being cooked in a pan. By my third and final tour of the day, I was already exhausted despite drinking copious amounts of water to combat the heat. I was aware that another ranger would replace me for the next ship. During my walk around halfway through, I started feeling disoriented and lightheaded. My strength dwindled gradually until I could no longer stand. Seeking respite, I settled under a nearby tree to rest and regain my energy. However, the intensity of the sun and the heat proved overpowering. That's when things began to appear surreal, as if trapped between reality and illusion. Tall, shadowy figures emerged from behind trees, moving aimlessly and at a slow pace, immobilized and struggling to breathe properly. I sat there fixated on their eerie presence. Within minutes, an uncountable number of these figures had materialized, some seemingly rising straight from the ground. Initially, they paid me no attention. Merely wandering around and emitting agonizing screams, reminiscent of someone being cooked alive, Suddenly, one of these figures noticed me and slowly approached, compelled to crouch due to its towering height of over eight feet. I was petrified, devoid of the strength to react. The figure's screams persisted without pause as it positioned itself beside me, placing its hand on my cheek. I began to feel an intense burning sensation, and consciousness slipped away from me. Approximately an hour later, my fellow rangers discovered me unconscious on the ground. They promptly called for an ambulance, and upon awakening, I found myself in a hospital bed. However, my relief was short-lived as I gazed upon a fiery red handprint seared onto my skin. The sight terrified me to such an extent that I had no choice but to resign. Understandably, my superiors and colleagues never believed my account. I can't say I blame them for their skepticism. There have been several reported sightings throughout Sedgwick County, all recounted by different law enforcement officials. Although such sightings are uncommon, they do occur. On October 17, 2010, another officer who was working outside of his usual schedule had his own unforgettable encounter. While patrolling the remote areas of Wichita, he witnessed something that left an indelible mark on his memory. A large, horned humanoid, unfamiliar to him, came into view. The officer's report detailed the events that transpired that morning. At approximately 7 a.m., I received a dispatch call regarding a suspicion person at an abandoned residence. Upon arriving at the location, I found no one or anything suspicious around the house. Consequently, I followed tracks leading north into the nearby woods, accompanied by Sergeant A., as we tracked, I caught sight of movement along the east hilltop through the thick brush. It appeared to be a hunched figure resembling a person moving northward behind cover. I immediately alerted Sergeant A to be on the lookout for what I had observed. Sergeant A joined me, inquiring about what I had seen as he approached. At that moment, both of us distinctly heard heavy footsteps originating from our 10 o'clock position. Despite our careful search, we could not visually confirm the source of the sound. Thus, we decided to head west toward our vehicle, where better lighting would aid our investigation. The being, whether human or otherwise, displayed exceptional caution in its movements. Both Sergeant A and I glimpsed what appeared to be an extraordinarily tall figure, standing upright but hunched over, approximately six feet in height. Its coloration seemed to be a grayish or possibly brown hue. As the being acknowledged our presence, it turned its head to the left, as if attempting to conceal itself using the surrounding trees. Sergeant Iowa asked if I had witnessed the same sighting, confirming that we shared the same experience. What we observed next froze us in our tracks. The being lifted its right arm over its head, revealing an enormous hand adorned with large black claws, resembling a paw but more akin to a human hand. Both Sergeant Day and I were startled by what we saw. 
To our surprise, a set of large horns protruded from its head, reminiscent of those found on a goat or ram. The sight left an indelible impression on our minds. Curiously, no reports matching this particular sighting have been documented. However, the region has seen numerous accounts of Bigfoot sightings reported by fellow officers. One such sighting was reported by a deputy sheriff who responded to a citizen's report of Bigfoot activity in the area. When the deputy arrived at the location, I accompanied him to investigate further. As my partner and I approached, we spotted something standing approximately 200 yards away. The figure, with only its head and shoulders visible, appeared non-human. It seemed to be observing something either within the vicinity or approaching from the ravine. What caught my attention were the two bright eyes positioned above the surrounding vegetation. My partner exclaimed, It's Bigfoot! In an attempt to intercept the creature before it reached Highway 54, we sprinted towards an adjacent open field. Regrettably, we lost sight of it. My partner proceeded towards the location where we had last seen it, maintaining a distance near the ravine, under the assumption that Bigfoot might still be present at the bottom of our line of sight. However, my partner reported, I don't see anything. As we made our way back toward each other, we noticed a large grayish figure peering down at us from an embankment. It seemed curious, observing our actions. The creature swiftly descended into a densely wooded area atop a nearby hillside, placing it in close proximity to the highway. Despite being deep into the open field with no trees or obstructions obstructing our line of sight, my partner and I both had a clear view of the creature as it fled from us. It did not move like a human, but instead appeared to be running on two legs. Its speed was astonishing, especially considering its size. I've served in law enforcement for over 22 years, and nothing else has come close to resembling the events of that day. Apart from the evidence left behind, such as footprints, we were unable to capture photographs or videos of the creature. However, my partner may have captured some footage while we were pursuing what we believe to be Bigfoot back into the wooded area. Unfortunately, his supervisors confiscated his camera, depriving us of any visual evidence. During the encounter, I was in uniform, but without my body armor or equipment belt, which sometimes proved limiting during pursuits through dense brush. I have reviewed Officer B's sighting report, which describes encountering a large, upright, grayish figure roughly 20 feet away from him near Highway 54. Just outside Sedgwick County, Kansas, on December 5, 2011. Coincidentally, this sighting occurred around the same time my partner and I were chasing a large, unidentified subject across the field. While we did not hear it running, we did hear something. Heavy moving through the tall grass nearby in a different direction. The sound was far too weighty to be that of a human. Although we did not regain visual contact, we remember seeing it about 150 yards away, looking downward. It was a day that will forever remain etched in my memory. My mother was born and raised in Texas, and she would visit her grandmother in Anna, Texas. This is a story my great-grandmother told my mother, and my mother told me. She lived out in the country and raised chickens and was a tough old pioneer woman. Her husband had died and she was alone on the farm. It was the early 1900s. She had chickens being stolen, so she had a shotgun by the door to catch whoever or whatever it was. Once she woke up in the middle of the night to chickens making a racket. She said that she saw a very tall, hairy creature standing on two legs in the pen. She blasted one barrel at the creature and it turned to run. She shot at it with the other barrel. She insisted the story was true and had a peppered front porch railing and posts to prove it. My dad's brother had a cabin near Leroy, Michigan. He would take my brother and me to his cabin on many weekends during the year. When I was around 14 years old and my brother was 12, he taught us to hunt and fish and shoot guns. We never missed a chance to go with him as he had no children. He also had a huge German shepherd that was fearless. On one occasion, we were walking on state land with a dog. It was the middle of the day in the fall. 
The path we were on led us around this small hill about ten feet high. We could see over the woods. Then suddenly it went quiet, but soon it sounded like a freight train coming through the woods towards us from the hill. The dog went crazy, and it took every bit of strength my uncle had to hold him back. He went up there to fight whatever was coming at us. I think I could safely say we were terrified except for that dog. It was running on two legs with heavy, pounding feet. The branches were breaking. Then, just as it should have come crashing over the little hill, it went completely silent. Nothing. The dog went quiet, but kept looking at the top of the hill where this thing should have been. We waited for a bit. My uncle said we should go back. No words were spoken on the trek back, and it was never spoken of until I started watching your videos. There are a couple of old guys talking about an incident that happened years and years ago. My uncle's long gone, but I wish I could go back and ask him about that day. Back in 1969, during the winter, we couldn't get up the road to the cabin as the snow was too deep. We pulled over and pulled our supplies up the road in a toboggan. My dad's other brother came up with his snowmobile. We had fun until it was time to go. It was a Sunday evening as we packed up our things and trudged back down to the cars. It was dark and snowing, and my uncle had left his car keys back up at the cabin. I told him I'd walk back and get the keys. It took me about a half hour to get back up there. I grabbed the car keys and started to make my way back down the two, track through the woods. I had only gone a little way when I heard branches breaking, like something was following me down the hill. It was off to my right side, paralleling me. It was close, but I couldn't see anything. All I had was my hunting knife, so I pulled it out and began running down the hill, knowing any moment I was going to be attacked. I've never been so afraid. Just then, I heard my uncle's snowmobile coming up the hill, and his headlights shining at me. He had decided I was taking too long and pulled his machine off the trailer to find me. He passed me and drove up a way to turn around. I was back at the vehicles when my other uncle came back. He asked me if I had lost my knife. I guess I dropped it in the snow running down the hill. It should have been buried in that deep snow, but my uncle said it was on top and easy to spot. I never told anyone what really happened or why I had my knife out of the sheath. In the 1980s, I was married and living in Dar, Michigan, about two hours south of my uncle's cabin. There were lots of woods and living in a nice house. One summer, in the middle of the night, we both woke from a sound sleep by what sounded like a woman screaming at the top of her lungs. My wife was terrified when she asked me if I heard that. Knowing she had heard it and I wasn't dreaming, I jumped up, put my pants on, and grabbed my pistol. Whatever it was started screaming again, and I ran into the woods. I was shining my flashlight all over, but not seeing anything. I stopped and stood still for a long time and slowly walked back to the house. I told my wife it was probably a rabbit getting caught by a fox or coyote and never spoke about it again. That scream that we heard that night was no rabbit or owl, and I've heard them both. This happened around three years ago, and thinking about it still makes me feel uneasy. I live in a rural area surrounded by a nature conservation area. There are many nice paths, and it's a great peaceful and quiet place to go for walks, ride bikes. On this day, I decided to take my dog for a walk there in the evening. I didn't want to go that far. For some reason, I decided to leave my phone at home even though I usually take it with me just in case. Everything was going well, and as usual, I barely met anyone. At some point, I got to my favorite spot, a wooded area. There's a field behind it, and I planned on walking all the way to the end. Then I wanted to turn around and take the same way home. As I continued walking after I made it through the wooded area, my dog started acting strange. She kept looking back and didn't want to go on. I thought she had spotted a deer or a rabbit and wasn't concerned. I didn't look around right away. But then she let out a little growl bark. I had never heard her do that before. I turn around and sure enough, there's a man standing on the edge of the wooded area field like maybe 10 meters next to the path. He was fully clothed and didn't move. He was just staring at us. My heart was pounding. No matter where I would go, 
I would still be in a secluded area for a while. I didn't think and just started walking quickly towards the end of the field. My dog still wasn't having it. When I turned around after getting a bit further away, he had also moved. Now he was standing on the field, still staring intensely. That's when I really knew we had to get going. I didn't look back until we got to the end of the field, because of some tree as my view was obstructed. I couldn't see him, and my dog seemed a bit calmer. Obviously, I didn't want to stop for more than a few seconds, though. From there on, I decided to take to the, the path that would take me to some part of my town the quickest. We literally ran, and I was so relieved when we made it back to civilization. I have no idea what his intention was. I'm just proud of my dog for alerting me. Friend and I went camping when we were around 18. Found an awesome flat area off the side of a rather steep hill that overlooked the lake nearby. I can't remember the name of the lake, not important, but it was large enough that we couldn't see the other side. We were there for a couple of days, were fishing, setting a couple snares, pretty much pulling a survivorman. On the third night, we hadn't lit the fire yet. We wanted to see the stars. Being Toronto kids, we rarely got to see too many. Sure enough, moonless night, no light, source around anywhere, and there are the stars. I pointed out a few passing satellites. I miss having such great vision. He named off the constellations that he knew. We were chatting then we saw it. On the horizon, a small and very bright red dot appeared. Looked like a gun laser dot. We both sat there racking our brains and making aliens jokes. But sure enough, it was getting closer. Soon it was the size of a dime, then a quarter, but it's taken the shape of an eye, and yet it got closer and closer. We started thinking that maybe it was a forest fire or something. Maybe it really was aliens with a nervous laugh. I remember him getting his hunting knife out of its sheath, and I did the same. Ready for anything. Finally, it's the size of a football actually lighting up the area we were in. We were able to see the red glow off the trees and the lake. About here is when I realized we were looking at the rising blood moon. The lake was perfectly still, and the moon was reflecting off of it. He physically slept himself into a face palm. We were city kids, after all. In the town of Bladenboro, North Carolina, just eight miles southwest of Elizabethtown, where I stay, it was said a demon cat from hell used to stalk the woods killing livestock and making the locals scared. Then it suddenly disappeared. That's what they say anyway. We know it didn't. To this day, there have been reports of something that looks like an abnormally large mountain lion with blood-red eyes and fur as black as night. Its cries have been compared to that of a woman being torn apart and screaming for her life. Luckily, it only has a taste for goats and cows, or so we think anyway. I will tell you there have been a few people that have gone missing. Some have been found, and to hear some of the police tell the story, the bodies were torn to shreds. It's not just located in Bladenboro, like most think. It goes from Bladen Lake State Forest to the Green Swamp Preserve area, which covers three counties and 1225 square miles. A friend of mine was hunting one day down in Green Swamp Preserve when it started getting dark. If you hunt in this area, you know you've got to be out of the woods before dark by law. So he climbed down from his tree stand and began the long walk through the swamp and underbrush to where he parked his truck. Now my friend is a cornbread, fed southern boy, and has the size to prove it, standing six feet six inches with a weight of 260 pounds of pure farmhand muscle. He isn't small by any standards. So he learned not to be scared of anything. He said what happened next made him never want to go in the swamp hunting again. Making his way through the brush, he said he began hearing something walking through the woods toward him. He stopped to listen for it and said it sounded like a large black bear, so he got his gun ready just in case. When he stopped, it stopped. When he walked, it walked. He said it made him nervous, because whatever it was knew he was there and won't be running off. He said he started making noise and even shot his shotgun in the air. 
It didn't leave. Instead, it let out a growl, he said. You could feel as much as here. All the way through the woods, it stayed just behind him out of sight. When he came out of the woods under the dirt road, he said his truck was about 50 yards down from him. He decided it was a pretty good chance that whatever it was following him was going to keep following or make a move on him there. So he took off running. It took off running, too. He said it sounded like a bulldozer was crashing through the woods. And when it broke from the woods, it sounded like a horse running through loose dirt. He could hear the stomps of its feet and the growling in its breath. He didn't have to look back to know it was coming and catching up to him. He shot behind him, hoping it would scare it enough to stop for a moment and give him a chance to make it to the truck. When he did, he said he must have hit it because it screamed, and for a moment he thought it was a person. That's when he finally turned around. He said it was jet black, as big as a 600-pound black bear, with a tail as long as its body, and eyes that were glowing red. He hit it, and it was just standing there looking at him as if to say, Now, you've done it. He bolted to the truck and jumped in. Just as he shut the door, he looked, and it was right there. He said it was so close, its breath was fogging the window. By now, he said he was shaking badly, and it was everything he could do to get the key in the ignition and start the motor. He drives a Ford F-354 wheel drive that was raised up so that there's a good two feet of clearance under the truck. He said this thing was on all four feet and looking eye to eye with him and his truck. The engine started and he took off like a bat out of hell. He said it chased him as hard as it could until he picked up speed and stopped and watched him drive off. The next day, he and his dad went back with guns and looked around for tracks, blood, or even a dead body. He said there was no blood, even though he knows it was shot, and there were paw prints as big as his hands on the ground everywhere. Then they found a tree that nine feet up had claw marks, one inch deep in the wood, spaced four inches apart from each other. They didn't venture into the woods, nor did they go too far from the truck. Both of them said they felt as though they were being watched and didn't want to stick around to find out what it was. They got back in the truck, and that's when they heard it a scream from the woods off in the distance. He said it was like a woman screaming bloody murder. It let him know it was there, waiting. Yep, there are many dark secrets in the woods. Charlie Daniels even wrote about these woods in one of his songs. If you ever get adventurous and want to try your luck, come on down to Green Swamp, and when the sun goes down, get real quiet. You might hear that scream. I hope when you do, it's off in the distance and not close by. Because if it is, well, it might just be the last sound you hear. My cousin and I were on a camping trip to the Bohemia mine area like we do at least two times a year. This was in 1992, or 1993, I believe in August. We set up camp and then hiked around until evening. Then came back and made dinner. After dinner, it was dark, so we went up to Lookout Tower, which besides Bohemia Mountain itself, was the highest peak, about 6,000 feet. There was a major shower that weekend, and we went up to watch it. We stayed up there till about 20, one I think, and then went back to our camp. We stayed up for about half of an hour, then went to bed. We had a three-man tent to sleep in. At about 22, 23, I was just about to fall asleep when I started hearing branches breaking like something walking through the woods towards us. It started a ways away from our camp and kept getting closer. My cousin was calling my name and asking me if I had heard the sounds, but I was concentrating on listening to them and too scared to answer him, so I just lay there like I was asleep. We had taken his car up there, and we parked it about 100 feet away from our tent because there was too many branches and stuff to drive it all the way up to the tent. The noises stopped, and all of a sudden there was high-pitched and fast whoop, 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 that from about where his car was parked. My cousin asked what that noise was and said nothing because it scared me to death. Then it started walking our way, and we just laid there and listened, and it got closer and closer to our tent until it came about a couple of feet away. We were so scared we laid there and didn't move a muscle because whatever it was had been walking on two feet, not four. 
It stopped making noise a couple of feet away, and we couldn't hear any walking until we could hear. It was right next to the tent. It had snuck up real quiet. We could hear it breathing. When my cousin moved a leg, it scared whatever was outside our tent, and it took off running, and we could hear the individual steps. It hit the ground like thunder. It sounded very heavy. It ran off about 50 feet and stopped. Then it would start walking back towards us, got within about 10 feet. Then we couldn't hear it anymore. Then all of a sudden it was right next to the tent. It had snuck up real quiet again to our tent. It could move very quiet when it chose to. It moved from one side of the tent to the other quietly and fast. It would be on one side and then the other before we knew it. It did this pretty much all night. It had left once, then came back. Finally, we fell asleep off and on. In the morning, we looked for tracks, but there was too much forest litter to see any. We did not have any protection with us at the time, and I have never been so scared in my life. I have believed in Sasquatch pretty much all my life. My cousin and I go up there a couple of times a year to look for evidence and hope to have another encounter, but it have not. I have hunted since I was a little boy with my father and continue to hunt today, and I know the sounds deer, elk, and other four-legged creatures make when walking, and this creature definitely was walking on two legs. Deer usually visit our camp when we go up there, and we can hear them coming in the dark. They get close, and we can see them in the flashlight. I have read other accounts in books after ours and have found a few similarities, like the heavy footsteps when it ran, the whoop. Whoop, whoop, we heard is also in Roosevelt's account, I believe, as well as others. My cousin and I have read books about the 40s and some of the miners reported seeing Bigfoot. There is also other reports from the Cottage Grove area that I have from old newspapers. I've became a volunteer researcher and have read a lot of reports, and my cousin and I have gone over this in our heads to make sure that it couldn't have been another animal that visited us, and we know that it was a Sasquatch. I'm Park Ranger Antony, stationed in the dense Ozark forests. I never expected the chilling events that unfolded during a routine patrol. Eerie whispers shattered the tranquility, drawing me toward an unknown present. Curiosity compelled me to follow the haunting whispers through the labyrinthine forest paths. They led me to a concealed cave, its dark mouth inviting me to uncover its secrets. With trepidation, I stepped into the dimly lit abyss. Inside the cave, I stumbled upon an unimaginable sight, a cryptid unlike any I'd encountered before. It had the body of a dog, agile and swift, but with an eerily human-like face. The creature, known as the Crawler, radiated malice. Without warning, the Crawler lunged at me with incredible speed and ferocity. I fought back, but its sharp claws left me wounded and vulnerable. Desperation gripped me as I realized the gravity of the situation. I needed a weapon, a tool to fend off this unholy creature. In my gear, I found a small hatchet, a humble ranger's tool. Clutching it tightly, I summoned all my courage and brandished it before the crawler. Surprisingly, the creature hesitated, its malevolent eyes fixated on the glimmering metal. Seizing the moment, I swung the hatchet with all my might aiming to scare the cryptid into submission. The crawler recoiled, emitting a chilling howl as it retreated into the cave's darkness. Adrenaline surged through me, knowing I had momentarily fended off the creature. Injured and shaken, I reached for my radio, trembling as I called for assistance. Relaying the unfolding events, I anticipated the incredulity that would follow. Who would believe in such an abominable cryptid lurking within our pristine forest? As I waited for help, doubts plagued my mind. Would they dismiss my account as mere imagination? Would my injuries be brushed off as a simple accident? Time would reveal if the truth of my encounter would be acknowledged. Nursing my wounds, I vowed to remain steadfast, despite disbelief or skepticism. Deep within the heart of the Ozarks, an unimaginable terror had altered my perception of the natural world forever. Help eventually arrived, accompanied by skeptical glances. Yet within me, the memory of that encounter would forever haunt. 
a testament to the cryptid lurking within the shadows. Was hiking the half dome trail in Yosemite, and there was a group of hikers that were huddled together, and everyone had stopped on the trail. We were going to walk past, and they told us that someone had just died a little way up. We all waited around for another 15 minutes or so, and everyone decided we had to keep going. Someone had slipped or fallen and hit their head on a rock. Not in a dangerous area, but we had to walk by the body to the right of us with his family, wife, and kids crying to the left. It was really tough and changed the mood of the entire hike. Felt so bad for his family. I'd say it was the time I learned how ruthless nature truly is. I was maybe eight and my parents had decided we'd go out for a hike in the woods. Somewhere along the way I saw a bird's nest on the ground and approached it. I got about halfway to it when I saw a snake in the nest in the process of eating the last chick in the nest. I'd say it's an important lesson for kids to learn. That nature doesn't give a flying F. I mean, but my experience was a bit extreme for an eight-year-old to see. Early on as a hiker, I had been hiking on a trail in California with a fairly large group when I fell behind and it got lost. An hour or so after I'd lost the path, it had gotten dark and I could now barely see two feet in front of me, even with a flashlight. Eventually, I meet this singular guy on the trail. No gear, no group, not even a flashlight. Just one guy walking in the dark in a baseball cap. He asks me if I'm lost, and when I say yes, he tells me he knows the way back to the main trail. I follow him while we make small talk, and eventually, when we get within 100 feet of the starting trail where I can see my group, he just turns around and walks back into the pitch-black forest without saying another word. My group tells me they've been waiting there for me for almost an hour and that they had started to get really worried. They said they were cutting the hike short and that everyone was going home. Apparently a guy had shot his wife in the head five miles from where we were and police were still searching for him because he had fled into the nearby forest. My brother is in the military and was doing a training operation in a forest the Canadian military has specifically for such activities. He had just finished a day mission and was being sent back in for a night mission. For the mission, my brother and another soldier were supposed to navigate in the dark to specific locations and find glow sticks set up in the bush. They got dropped off and were making good time finding three out of five glow sticks without issue. The fourth glow stick is when they began to struggle. According to my brother, him and his buddy were using night vision goggles, which turn everything a green color and any light becomes very bright. My brother's buddy suddenly exclaims right there, and my brother sees a glowing light seemingly suspended in midair. He quickly walks towards the light when it suddenly starts moving and becomes two lights. He falls backward and Crab walks away from the big-ass bear in front of him. They hadn't seen the glow stick but the reflection of the minimal light in the bear's eyes. The bear was standing at its full height as they approached. As they both scrambled backwards and fired blanks up into the air to scare it off it dropped down and stalked off into the bush. My brother and his buddy skipped the fourth glow stick and told their superiors about the bear encounter. They said they were lucky it wasn't a mother bear or it could have been ugly. His superiors told him after that the blanks they send them in with are basically useless because the animals in the area are so used to sounds of gunfire and explosions. My grandmother, my mom's mother, recently passed away about two weeks ago. It was a very hard time for my family and my mother. She was the very last grandparent I had as my other grandparents passed away years ago. Additionally, in April of 2021, I lost two uncles within five weeks of each other, both my mother's brothers. One was expected, and the other was not. 
so it's been a rough couple of years for my poor mother. She's slowly healing, but I'm sure it still hurts her. She was over at my house last night and was telling me about traveling back home. She had to fly overseas for the funeral and about how it was nice being with her family and just laughing and crying together. She had made it back home one day before my grandmother passed and got to see her one last time. My mom told me some interesting stuff that happened while she was back home with my grandma. The first thing happened after my grandma was hospitalized. She had been taken to the hospital at some point before my mom got there. Mom said while the family was visiting her, my grandma, who was 97 years old at the time, and mostly blind, said she could see her husband, my deceased grandpa, and my two uncles that had passed away, all standing in the room waiting for her. My mom and aunts and uncles were asking her what she is talking about and told her there was no one here. I have heard about people seeing loved ones right before dying, so I thought that was really interesting. Not much after that, my grandma passed and they had the funeral for her. Almost the whole town came to my grandma's funeral, as funerals are a big deal back home. My mom, of course, was devastated, but it was expected after all. That night, Mom told me she had a dream that she was with a bunch of deceived cousins and family, as well as some living ones. My mom said she looked at her deceased relatives and said, What are you guys doing here? She said one of her cousins then said, We're just waiting for your mom. Mom said at that point one of her cousins, who was alive, came up to her and gifted her with two boxes of sweets. He said, one is for you and one is for sister. We are sorry for your loss. Mom said after that she woke up. The next day, my mom said she went to my grandma's house to clean out some things with my aunt. Mom said they had a ton of visitors and people coming by to pay their respects. At one point, my mom said her cousin from the dream came to see her. He had brought two boxes of sweets with him. He gave one to my mom and one to my aunt and... Obviously, my mom was shocked. She told him about the dream, and they all kind of laughed together and discussed it. My mom kept repeating to me how shocked she was at that moment when the same scenario from the dream happened. I asked my mom, who is 56, about what she thought about Grandma seeing the dead relatives and what this all means, the dream included. She said, I really don't know, but it has to be something good. I told her I agreed. In my opinion, there is something very comforting about knowing you could get to see all of your loved ones again when you die, and that they almost welcome you home as you pass away. This tells me there just has to be something better waiting for us after this life. I just know it. Thank you for reading. Right off the bat, I'll tell you my 16-year-old kid telling absolutely the truth so God strike me dead. I hope you don't take my report as bogus because of that. Let me explain my situation to you. I live and have lived on the Mala River for most of my life and never thought twice about walking around at night or anywhere, period. About two months ago, I was alone in my grandma's house using the computer when I decided to go home. My house is only about 50 yards away. As I was stepping outside, the most hideous feeling of being alone and fear thumped my heart. I kept walking in terror when, all of a sudden, about 30 feet off to my right, I heard a loud thumping sound crash out. From there on, being distorted by my act of running faster than I've ever moved before, I could swear I heard the distinctive two-legged footsteps veering toward me from off the trail between houses I raced in my house, slammed the door, locked it, and sat in the living room to calm down from my strange experience. The oddest feelings flushed through me then, and now... Now, before you dismiss my story as a frightened child running from noises, he will have to tell you of the strange past our 45 acres of land at the end of the Dickey Prairie Road has had. Around three years ago, when we had cattle and cows fenced on our property, noticed casually of how they would. Always stay together and go near the barns at night. Then one day, we discovered two of them killed up in the woods by the drinking creek. The killings weren't average killings either. The cows didn't have a scratch on them. Both had brocken necks and their eyeballs sucked out cleanly. 
Since those experiences, I'm now scared to go hiking and travel at night. Yes, average signs of fear, but I have the weird feeling of being an intruder. Thank you for your time sincerely. Sean Murray, P.S. I'm a believer. I've lived in Florida my whole life. My sisters and me grew up playing in the woods. They were more than a few times we got weird feelings like we were being followed and we would end up running all the way home. We also found what looked like walking sticks with animal skulls on top, and the sticks were decorated with beads. We lived in the middle of nowhere, which made it more creepy because we never ran into anyone else out there. One instance that really sticks out, though, is something that happened to my wife, my son, and me about a year ago. We were checking out a new area to hunt later on in the year. We were walking down a game trail and came up to a big rabbit sitting in the middle of the trail, just staring at us, and no matter how close we got to it, it wouldn't move, and the woods were quite as could be. Out of nowhere he darts the way we came in and stops and stares at us again. So we start walking towards him and darts down the trail again, but stopped. It was like he wanted us to follow him, so we did. He ended up leading us to a cool little creek where it seemed like he disappeared. We ate lunch and spent the rest of the day there, but we had an intuition not to go back down that trail. I wasn't alone when this happened. When I was 14, about 6 years and 11 months ago, my scout troop was doing a backpacking trip out in northeastern Oregon. It was some seriously isolated country. The nearest town, with a population of like 70, was about 50 miles as the crow flies away. Nearest town, with a population of more than a couple hundred, was probably about 100 miles away. In the nearest population center, you could call a city, was easily hundreds of miles away. We were probably the only people out there for dozens of miles in any direction. One night, after a hard day of hiking in the hot August heat, we were sitting around the fire just relaxing around midnight. Fourteen people not including me. Twelve scouts between the ages of twelve and almost eighteen, and two adult scout leaders. No drugs or alcohol, because it was a Boy Scout thing. We were just shooting the shit when we saw this gigantic, bright, glittering orb slowly moving across the sky. It was a full moon without a cloud in the sky that night, and it was easily twice the size of the moon and a couple times brighter. We thought it was a comet or something, but I've never seen any pictures or videos on the internet that even came close to resembling it. It was just so bright and glittering. We sat there awestruck because it was quite beautiful, then it just stops in mid-air, just hangs there for a couple seconds. Then it break up into five smaller but just as bright orbs, two dart into the sky incredibly fast, and disappears from sight in seconds. One goes parallel to the ground and also disappears from sight with seconds, and two go towards the ground, until the terrain. About ten or so miles away obscures them from view. Then another orb, just as big and bright, appears and does the same thing. Stops in midair and breaks up. Now, that was weird, but the weirdest thing was this odd feeling I started feeling. Fear, dread, anger, hate. None of those can describe it. It was like whatever part of me that assigns emotions to stimuli just could not decide what emotion to assign to this. It just knew it was bad and wrong somehow. The consensus around the campfire was that everyone was feeling the same thing. We had no reason to feel this, but we were all feeling it. Even one of our scoutmasters, a Marine Corps infantry vet who served in Vietnam and had 25 years of law enforcement experience at the time, was seriously freaked out. Then we heard footsteps all around our camp. I know the difference between animal footsteps and human footsteps. Animals walk with a lot of caution. They walk for a bit, stop and scope out the area, walk for a bit, and repeat. Especially when there are a dozen plus humans around. Humans just keep walking, they don't have any caution generally. And the frequency of the steps is different. 
These were human, or at least human sounding, and a lot of them it sounded like a bunch of people just pacing around our campsite. Flashlights revealed nothing. We should have seen them. The steps sounded close, but it looked like no one was there, just footsteps. The next day there were no tracks, no broken branches or downtrodden plants like you would expect to see. For the rest of the trip, we had someone on lookout every night. I'm not saying this was aliens or some government project or ghosts. I'm not sure if I even believe in those. I'm saying I saw something seriously weird, and I'm not jumping to any conclusions. When I asked the other guys who were there if they remember it, the response is always something to the effect of, Yes, I remember, but let's please not talk about it. Edit. Also, one time when I was hiking out in the Cascades during the winter, I found a deer skull sitting atop a pile of snow. No footprints around, no snow on the skull, so it had somehow ended up there pretty recently. I was in the mountains of North Carolina for several days. It was a beautiful and peaceful hiking trip with my brother, sister, and their friend Caleb until one early morning around 3 a.m., when every creature in a 10-mile radius was chirping, squeaking, howling, or scampering around through the woods. Being from the Midwest and having survived two tornadoes, I thought the worst weather event of my life was about to occur, and I was sleeping in a hammock, for those who don't know. Just before a tornado is formed above your head, every animal is fight will be freaking the F out. They know they can feel it. You can feel it too. You just won't know what that new feeling is until the 60-year-old trees beside you are being ripped from the ground. Being in the eye of a tornado is even more strange, as all those same animals inside are frozen. Sure, they still exist, but their little soul is on hold, and they don't do much more than look around quietly. It's creepy. Anyway, this wasn't a tornado. 3 a.m., the fire we made was just ambers and a roaring thunder of animals freaking out. I peeked my head out of my hammock, imagining getting my face smashed in by the first softball-sized hail with my luck just for looking. But no, there was no bad weather. There was no storm or looming catastrophe. It was a beautiful night, aside from the roaring animal kingdom. My brother peeked his head out of hammock above me and looked down to see if I was awake. When he saw my eyes as wide as saucers, he whispered, What the F is happening? I replied, I don't know. But I wish I was up there in your hammock. Being on the ground level usually is best for guys my size, up 235 pounds. I lack the grace to climb up hammock ropes and jump into bed eight feet off the ground. Anyway, the terrifyingly creepy roaring continued for about 30 seconds, and then it just suddenly stopped. It seemed to be a sweeping effect, where the outside of the radius stopped first and the creatures closer to us stopped last, but it was only a single second or two difference. It was pretty damn synchronized. My brother and I were freaked the F out. After five minutes of silence, we got out of the hammocks and started the fire up again. This time, we made sure it was big enough to light up a hundred feet out. The last thing we need is a Bigfoot or some weird shit going down. My brother went up to the ridge to check on my sister and Caleb, about 60 feet uphill from our hammocks. Caleb always wanted to be in the highest possible safe spot so he could watch the sunrise from his hammock. As soon as my brother got to their hammocks, he yelled a shrieking kind of yell for me, the kind I had only heard from him twice before, when his friend got his bike handle bar lodged in his stomach about an inch deep as a kid, and when he split his own head open. I ran up to the ridge with the axe in my right hand, the first aid bag in my left hand and flashlight in my teeth, expecting the worst. When I arrived to Caleb's bottom bunk, he was in a state of shock. His eyes were wide open. He was shivering and shaking, and he was staring down at the valley. Wouldn't you know? My sister didn't even wake up. Figures low, she had her headphones in all night, listening to her folk music. Apparently, she hates the sound of animals and prefers to have a controlled mental state where nothing can make her paranoid. We woke her up, and she had no idea what the hell was going on. 
She just stayed in her hammock like, what do you want me to do? We eventually got Caleb down to the fire and wrapped him in some blankets. I gave him a shot of whiskey to sip on, but he mostly just held it and stared into the fire. The whole night was too weird for sleep, but Caleb finally laid down next to the fire and fell asleep around 4.45 a.m. The sun came up and my siblings and I decided to leave the fire and go see the sunrise from the ridge. We all sat in Caleb's hammock, still bewildered. The sun was perfect and Caleb picked out the best spot you could imagine, as usual. But then my brother spotted something strange. What's that? He said, pointing down the valley, right there on the bank of the river. My sister and I struggled to get his perspective, but then finally noticed a clearing. We decided to go check it out, but one of us had to stay with Caleb. My sister volunteered, as she hates creepy things. She didn't want us to go down, but we insisted. I left her my axe and emergency GPS signal thing. I told her to just scream if she needed us and to not hesitate to use her pepper spray. She just said, stop freaking me out and just go. I'll be here when you get back. So my brother and I hiked down to the river. It took about 20 minutes. When we arrived, we felt very uncomfortable. There were no animals around whatsoever. No birds, no squirrels, nothing. The clearing on the river bank was about 100 yards upstream. We took to the higher side of the bank to keep our distance. I don't think either of us actually expected anything to go down, but we wanted to remain cautious. When we were about 50 yards away at a slight elevation to the clearing, we pulled out our phones to take pictures. But our phones were dead. Mine is known to die, but I have an external battery pack that attaches to my otter box that I know was fully charged. My brother's phone is always reliable and usually attached to his portable solar panel charger that he keeps on the outside of his pack. His shit was dead, too. Both of us tried to hold our power buttons, not believing they were really dead. But when we realized they were definitely not going to turn on, we both got that paranoid look on our faces. We decided to leave, but not before carefully studying the clearing for a few seconds. It was about 100 feet across in the shape of a triangle. All of the bushes and plants that typically grow alongside the river were all flattened down. Even some mature azalea bushes that typically stand six, eight feet tall were eerily laying flat. It's as if everything in that triangle shape had bent down as close to the ground as it could get. Nothing appeared broken, but rather as if it had grown along the earth instead of growing up toward the sun. It was weird as shit, and only in that triangle area. When we got back to camp, Caleb was awake. My sister had a weird look on her face. Caleb was totally normal. Hey, bro, you all right? My brother asked. Caleb just casually answered. Yeah, man, doing well. Missed the sunrise, but I guess I needed to sleep. We just looked at him, concerned. Like, what the F? He was eating a breakfast bar and heating up coffee over the fire. We sat down across from him and I asked, So hey, do you remember that shit last night? He looked at me puzzled. My brother added, you know, when all the animals freaked out and we found you. He just looked so confused. My sister said, Caleb, stop playing. He asked, what are you talking about? My brother said, bro, you were messed up last night. Caleb laughed and responded, Yeah, I figured I had to be, because I never sleep next to the fire all wrapped up in blankets. Not after getting that bug in my ear that one time, lo. We continued to ask him questions, but he had no memory whatsoever. As far as he was concerned, he had a few too many drinks and slept next to the fire. We told him our story, and each of us agreed, but he had no recollection. We told him about the spot next to the river and how our phones wouldn't turn on. We pulled our phones out to show him, and they were already on. My brother had 67% battery, and mine had 41%. We got the creeps real quick. We decided to pack up camp and get the F away from that spot. But before we did a final sweep, Caleb asked, Have you guys seen my camera? He had a nice DSLR Sony with a nice lens. And that shit was gone. The weirdest part is he slept with it in his hammock every single time he goes camping, and we've never seen it not on his body. 
He even specifically remembered taking it to bed and tucking it in its bag and putting the lens in its sleeve. It's like a ritual for him. He takes super good care of his belongings. We searched around the ridge and all around the fire and in between the two spots. It was nowhere to be found. Caleb even went down the ridge a bit toward the river in case it had fallen out and rolled down the hill. But it was gone. We had to leave and my siblings and I agreed to pitch in to buy him a new one if he would just get the F out of there with us. About three miles and one hour later, my brothers turned to me on the trail and said, Do you think he tried to take a picture of some shit he wasn't supposed to see? The creepiest feeling swept over me, and I replied, Bro, let's just forget how messed up he was and get the hell away from here. He nodded in agreement. It's been about a year now, and they haven't seen or heard from Caleb in eight months. No one has. I was working at around 2 a.m. on the north end of my jurisdiction on a dirt road that dipped slightly down in elevation into a tamarack and red-white pine swamp. I'm patrolling along the road because it's a known back way for drunk drivers to take to avoid the main route at bar time in between neighboring villages. Just south of me a quarter mile as the crow flies is a small Native American reservation populated with residential but I'm essential working somewhere that I shouldn't see anyone other than passing vehicles. Certainly no one on foot. It's in summer, early fall, where the days are warm, but the nights were cold. As I'm driving, I have my window down, enjoying the brisk temps. I'm a Wisconsin, and for some reason I was driving fairly slow, probably only about 20 miles per hour. Off to my left, I hear very distinctly the sound of water thrashing, and my mind initially thinks I hear maybe a deer or a bear running through the water. Had seen a black bear the night before, near where I was, on this night. I came to a quick stop and used my spotlight and left alley takedown floodlight to hit where I thought I'd see something like the black bear. Fella! but there was zero movement, just the sound of weighty water slushing away from me. Where I was looking was not thick with woods, but more adolescent pines and smaller underbrush with a dry ridge only 50 yards away from me. I had lots of clear sight lines in between larger pines to the hill past the water. I estimated the water to be only maybe a foot deep, but as I'm seeing nothing make the sounds that I'm hearing, my mind then thinks that maybe it's a someone in the water, but hiding behind a tree to avoid me, and so I have a concern for them because of how cold it was that morning. But I see nothing. The sounds of water moving was very distinct, and to me sounded bipedal and head in. My perception was telling me that I should be seeing something only a couple dozen feet away from me, but there was just the sound. I called out asking if anyone was there, but nothing. The swishing of water stopped, and I saw nothing walking up the ridge as if it had cleared the water. I didn't spend much longer looking into the barely lit woods over the water. I rolled my window up and continued on briefly, hoping that I hadn't stranded a guy in the dark, cold, wet woods. That's what my rational mind was thinking. But there was definitely a shit alarm going off in my lizard brain, telling me to boot scoot the F out of there the moment I didn't see anything running through the water. It was a back of the neck tingly moment. The noise was so loud enough to hear it while driving in a vehicle, but there was only the pretty calm shimmer of the water and nothing that I could see running through a foot of water. This happened two falls ago and I remember that morning every time I drive through there. As a former paramedic and nurse, I've seen a lot of things that have made me question the nature of our existence. But one aspect of the job, in particular, stands out as evidence of something beyond our understanding. Have you ever seen someone die? I mean really die, not just slip into a coma or vegetative state. I've seen people die, and yet their body carries on for hours, almost as if they're still alive, but something has left them. It's hard to describe, but you can tell when someone is no longer there. It's like the light has gone out of their eyes. Their body is just an empty vessel. 
But here's the thing. I've also seen the opposite happen. In traumatic deaths, when the body is failing and should be giving up, the person keeps on fighting. It's almost as if their will to live is stronger than their body's ability to keep going. I know this may not be proof of a higher power or the afterlife, but it does prove to me that there's more to our existence than we can comprehend. It's a humbling and awe-inspiring realization to know that there's still so much we don't understand about life and death, and it's made me more grateful for every moment I have on this earth. I'm working a maintenance job midnight to 5 a.m. in the old Denver Light and Gas Building, 15th and Champa, downtown Denver. There's a few people around there during the day, but after hours, the place is pretty empty. I'm working by myself and haven't seen a person all night. I go to the bathroom on the third floor, which is a narrow, long room. Walk in the door, two urinals directly to your left then two stalls after, then a sink against the wall behind the stalls, then interior wall of the building. I hit the first urinal, and as I'm finishing, I hear plain as day, the sink turn on, and a variance is in the water noise like someone is washing their hands. I zip up turn, and the sink stops, so I just stand at the end of the stall, because there's maybe two feet between the stalls and the wall that leads to the sink, and it just dead ends at the sink. So there's not really room for two people to pass each other and definitely not enough room at the sink for two people. It only took maybe two or three seconds, but I'm like WTF. There's nobody else in here with me. I wasn't tired. I can honestly say I heard what I heard and I don't get freaked out imagining things. It's the only one thing in my life that I've ever experienced like that. Been there several time after and haven't heard anything like it since. I have been a park ranger in a national park located in England for just over 10 years. I'm not going to reveal which one or even the county for the sake of my job, as I still work here. But there are some pretty weird things that you find every so often while on shift. Things that my superiors would likely not appreciate me sharing online. My job mainly involves patrolling the trails and checking that they're all in a safe state for people to walk through. I was also asked to talk with school children and assemblies and such after about a year or so on the job to express how important it is to stay with the group on the trails. I gave pretty obvious reasons for this, but... Little did I know I would soon discover some of the horrifying truths as to why they should never wander off. The first story I'm going to share with you took place on a beautiful spring morning in June. I think this was during my first year on the job. The sun was still low in the sky, but it was slowly rising and brightening my surroundings. I was on a normal morning patrol through one of the deeper trails as it hadn't been checked recently and protocol to frequently check all the trails for fallen trees and any potential natural hazards to hikers. It was such a beautiful morning. I remember walking along with a slight smile on my face as I listened to nature waking up in the trees. I found the cool breeze very relaxing and it had a truly peaceful effect on my mood. Suddenly the trees to my left were filled with the sounds of birds squawking loudly as they frantically flew away. I stopped and listened for just a moment. Silence. The quote from another story I've read here reads very true to this situation. Prey is silent when predators are near. Now, understand that we don't have any bears or wolves here in England. Nothing like that. So I suppose it could be a deer that had snapped a twig. However, the noise wouldn't usually drop like that as deer don't pose much of a threat to wildlife at all. I continued on, not thinking anything of it, and after a short time I got the urge to check behind me. There was a man walking maybe 100 meters back, and I was on a long straight, so it was easy to tell. I was confused as the trails aren't usually used until a little later when early dog walkers would show up, and even then... Few would wander this far into the woods at this time. He seemed to be walking at a very relaxed pace, his hands in his dark blue hoodie's pockets, and 
He had faded blue jeans. I radioed over to ask if anyone had seen someone enter the trail. I was walking shortly after I left, but no one had seen anyone come in or out other than the occasional dog walker. I thought nothing of it, but continued on a slightly hurried pace. I usually wouldn't be bothered about it, being out on my own with another stranger. I wasn't a small bloke, nor someone to get spooked easily. However, this guy just gave me a bad feeling. I was approaching a gate that leads to a much denser area of the woodland, more like a thick forest. And as I closed the gate behind me, I noticed this man had stopped dead in his tracks. He seemed to be staring right at me, but I couldn't be sure. Then he broke into a sprint, not a light jog that somebody out for exercise might. I'm talking a full-on sprint. It was almost aggressive. I freaked out and turned to run. Why would a complete stranger who was previously so calm and relaxed suddenly be sprinting at me? He hadn't called for help or even waved to me. Fortunately, the trail's long straight section was over and I ran. Around a curve and hid behind one of the many large rocks that were by the side of the trail. I could hear his heavy footsteps thudding towards me right until he was just on the other side of the rock, and he stopped again dead in his tracks. He wasn't even out of breath. He just seemed to stand there for a while and then just walked off. I waited for what must have been close to ten minutes to be sure he was far ahead and radioed the strange encounter to my colleagues who agreed it was strange. I cautiously continued on with my patrol. I never saw that strange man again, and I hope I never do. I have many more memories I would like to share with you. Stay safe out there. You are rarely truly alone in the forest. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.